Uh, good morning. I want to call to order the public meeting number 254. Um, first, we have the approval of the minutes. Commissioner Stebbins. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I move to approve the minutes of the. Whoops. I move to approve the minutes of the October 11th, 2018 regular commission meeting as included in your packet, subject to any immaterial corrections or grammatical changes. I second that. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Four zero. Next, we'll move on to our administrative update. Executive Director Bajorjian. Good morning, Commissioners. Good, Good morning. morning. Um, Good morning. Just by um, way of procedural, we have a, um, a substitute person doing our streaming today. John is here in place of uh, Mike, who's out today. Um, and um, just for the speakers, not the commissioners, if we could just reintroduce ourselves, it helps John. So for the record, I am Ed Bedrosian, the executive director. Um, I have a couple of items. One, I have a general update. And the second, uh, we have a budget closeout that uh, Commissioner Zuniga is going to uh, substitute for our CFAO, who is out today. Um, but by way of a general update, I did want to give you an update on our uh, wind suitability review investigation and where we stand. Uh, the Investigations and Enforcement Bureau is completing its report. Once the report is complete, there are a few more procedural steps before an actual hearing in the report can be made public. I want to outline those steps for you. Uh, first, the commissioners individually will be provided a copy of the report along with the exhibits. We anticipate that will consist of hundreds of pages of documents. As a licensee, WIND LLC representatives will also be entitled to a copy of the report and exhibits. Simultaneously, the IEB and WIN will prepare their presentations for a hearing in front of the Commission. The legal division also will review the report for any redactions in conformance with the public records law, and this is consistent with the Commission's previous practices. Once all this pre-hearing preparation is done, and you as commissioners have had time to hear and decide any pretrial motions and time individually to read the reports and necessary exhibits, and the parties are adequately prepared for their presentations. The legal division, headed by General Counsel Blue, will work to schedule the actual hearing. It would be at the beginning of the actual hearing that the report with any redactions would be made public. With all that in mind, I anticipate and hope that we can have any pre-hearing motions, again, if any, heard sometime in November with the actual hearing happening sometime the first two weeks of December. So that is, uh, that's my update. Okay. Um, absent any questions of which I would probably be vague and refer you back to my update, um, I will turn the, uh, uh, the physical update over to Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, I believe this is the exact same way we've held adjudicatory hearings in the past. This is the process. Yeah, well, that I can confirm, yes. That's, that, that, okay. that I can confirm, yes. We're, we're, we are being consistent with our adjudicatory per, per, uh, hearing process in the past. And there were some motions that had to be dealt with ahead of time. General Counsel, you were here for all of them? Um, there are from time to time. Mm -hmm. there, it's not... Um, guaranteed that there will need to be any motions to be heard, but we will make sure we allow time for that if they do, if they're filed and you do need to consider them. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Commissioner. Now over to me, I suppose. Um, good morning. I'm just going to be um, giving the update um, on behalf of uh, our director, our CFO, Derek Lennon, who's no, not here today because of a uh, um, uh, disability, really. Uh, but with me are going to be um, Agnes Bolio and uh, Doug uh, O'Donnell, who can help me either answer questions or clarify um, anything that I cannot. Um, included in the packet is a memo from uh, Director Lennon um, in a format that we've seen in the past, uh, summarizing the results of the fiscal year 2018 that ended uh, in June 30th of 2018. Um, 
through uh, just as a brief reminder, um, through the first three quarters of fiscal year 18, uh, this commission approved a budget of $30,960,000 for the Gaming Control Fund and uh, projected a revenue of $30,360,000. Um, based on the recommendations of the Finance Office, uh, the budget at the time of the third quarter um, was relying on at least 600,000 uh, in reversions to bridge the gap between the budget and anticipated revenues. Um, the Gaming Control Fund is composed of various spending categories and um, I'll remind uh, um, us and the public that uh, some of them are both regulatory and uh, statutory in nature. nature. We don't control uh, all of the costs. There's funding for the Attorney General's office. Um, there's indirect costs related to some of our expenditures and there's um, ABCC costs that, um, that the gaming control also funds. Similarly, um, our costs, uh, our overall costs include um, all those uh, efforts of the research and uh, responsible gaming um, arena. So uh, the, the chart on page two of the memorandum shows the, um, the spending and variance on each of the categories. Um, the Gaming Control Fund underspent its budget by $1,360,000. Um, at the same time, there were revenues that exceeded projections in terms of um, I believe some additional vendor licensing that we anticipated uh, to the tune of $174,000. Um, and when we couple these two figures with the net of the $600,000 uh, built-in deficit that we had anticipated as of um, quarter th the third quarter, uh, this all results in a $947,000 overage that we can revert back to the licensees. Um, for the overall, for the year. Um, so there's a couple of reasons these figures came in that way. Um, I'll just remind, um, remind my, my commissioners that, my fellow commissioners that um, uh, there's costs that um, came in uh, greater than we initially uh, anticipated, mostly in the legal uh, arena. Um, but, and we've talked about that, of course, plenty in the past. Um, there were a number of costs that were going to be uh, unique in the, uh, on the eve of the opening of MGM, and some of those costs um, came in as um, lower than we anticipated. We made these revisions along the way in the year, and those costs did not, uh, some of them cost, those costs did not um, come to fruition. Um, so um, our um, regulations describe how the Commission assesses its operational costs, um, including any kind of any increases or decreases at the end of the year. Um, that would be 205 CMR 12105, um, which is also part of the uh, memorandum. And uh, therefore, the FY18 surplus funds will be credited against FY19 assessments, some of which we started to do on the licensees in the same way uh, that uh, they were, uh, in the same proportion that they were assessed in fiscal year 18. The chart that explains that um, detail is, is um, included in the memo. Uh, that adds up to the $947,361 uh, and the proration of among the licensees. So um, I want to stop uh, there and um, let you ask any questions or uh, have my colleagues um, expound on anything that, I, that you think I missed. Questions? I had one. Um, uh, ABCC had some additional costs this year. I'm trying to recall the, the, the top of uh, page two on the memo. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'll um, let me uh, let me let me answer that. And I, uh, uh, if, if if I'm mistaken, or uh, please expound, Agnes. Um, like many other costs related to the M opening of MGM, mm -hmm. um, we initially um, were conservative and, and, and at the beginning of the year. 
and decided to um, make these additional provisions along the way in, during the year. Um, how that translates, how that translated, maybe the difference that we are uh, seeing here. Right. Previously, there was only one employee, and I believe they added an additional employee. With that, the fringe and indirect costs that go with it inflating <laughs> exponentially as well. Um, and I believe there was also another vehicle involved for their travel back and forth between the facilities. So with their additional responsibilities with the opening of MGM, right. plus the additional, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, is it fair to say that this was a one-time um, Yes, Surge. I believe so, yes. We, we, we might go back to the, uh, uh, level funding in the, in the coming months. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would point out they were uh, uh, very uh, instrumental partners at the opening. They were present on weekends, uh, high times and stuff like that, and it really helped us, um, you know, complete uh, both our missions. Right. I remember you uh, talking about the partnerships up there during the opening, the, the rush to get ready, so that makes sense. And, and you know what, let me also uh, mention, we had um, early, early discussions with them. Um, this was with uh, our prior executive director, Day, um, relative to the overall funding for them on an ongoing basis. Um, and that was at a, at, a, at a level that we've maintained, the one employee over at PPC. But given the opening and everything that was described, uh, there is a recognition that there need to be there needed to be additional resources that again will be smoothed out over time to the same level. Thank you. Other questions to emphasize? I mentioned uh, the the legal fees increases that uh, was offset in many ways by um, some of those um, um, not expenditures not at the level un anticipated, mostly along the lines of. Um, um, Attorney General's Office and State Police, uh, but those have been themselves revisions that we had increased. So in, in, a, in an interesting way, we ended up spending at those levels uh, as originally anticipated. Uh, do we have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the MGC's fiscal year 2018 budget closeout report is uh, included in the package. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes four to zero. Next, we move on to research and responsible gaming. Director Vanderlinden. <coughs> Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, why don't we just go, for the record, go down the line and just introduce ourselves. Mark Vanderlinden, Director of Research and Responsible Gaming. Christopher Bruce, I'm a Crime Analysis Consultant to the Commission. Detective Lieutenant Brian Connors, I'm the Commanding Officer of the Gaming Enforcement Unit, State Police. Lieutenant Tim Babin, State Police Commanding Officer, GEU Springfield. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Christopher Bruce today will present to you the baseline um, study um, assessing the impact of gambling and safety in Massachusetts towns and, and cities. It's a baseline analysis of crimes, calls for service, and collision data in the communities near MGM Springfield. Um, in 2014, the MGC began working with Mr. Bruce uh, to design a process to assess changes in crimes, calls for service, and collisions in communities likely to be affected by the opening of Massachusetts new, new casinos. Work began in 2015 with a baseline analysis of the Plainville area where Plain Ridge Park Casino opened um, in June of 2015. We had subsequent reports at six months, at one year, and at two year post opening that measured changes against that baseline. Our attention now turns to the Springfield area where MGM opened in August. 
As he'll describe in much greater detail, Mr. Bruce worked with local law enforcement in the Springfield and designated surrounding communities to build a baseline of existing crimes, calls for service, and collisions. Um, I would be remiss without noting that um, this, this report and any of this work um, would not be possible had we not the cooperation, collaboration, um, and really overall enthusiasm of, of the Springfield Police Department and the, the surrounding police departments um, to pull together this data and, and report it out as it's being presented to you today. So a sincere um, and heartfelt thank you to those, those agencies. Um, on a final note, and before I turn it over to Christopher, um, Many studies have attempted to study the effects of gambling on overall, uh, overall serious crime rates. Hardly any have attempted to analyze more specific and minute changes, including um, following the opening of casinos, including variations by hour, by month, and by season, changes in patterns of hot spots, and in non-crime activities such as collisions and calls for service. But these were the questions that the, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission was asking. Um, and it's with, with those questions and with the expertise that we have at the table and in the communities that we're working um, that we can answer those questions. We're analyzing public safety at a level of detail that will actually help police agencies anticipate and respond to emerging changes and patterns. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Mr. Bruce. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here again. I I want to emphasize that this is the baseline report, so there's no real conclusions to draw yet on as to the impact of uh, MGM Springfield just yet, but uh, I'll report on the, uh, the methodology I use to collect the data and, and what the at least the, the baseline data can tell us about what's uh, going on in the, uh, the MGM Springfield area. Um, in the Plainville project, there were six uh, participating communities. This one involves 11 uh, participating communities in the surrounding area. And as you can see them all on the map here, the, that's the scope of the project. It has been uh, you know, quite a bit larger than the, the previous efforts and has required a lot more uh, work with, with data collection and uh, the compilation of the, of the statistics and so forth. As Mark indicated uh, in, in the Plainville project, we're following the same basic t template that we used with Plainville, starting with the baseline report uh, and then moving on to uh, it, considerations of, of what's happened after a three month, six month, uh, maybe a nine month, depending on if after the six month period, it, we, we see a lot of changes, right? Uh, and then uh, a one year uh, period, and then we'll make a decision, I suppose, after that as to how often to, to keep evaluating. Uh, just like in, in Plainville, I visited each of the participating agencies and I established a connection to their records management and CAD systems uh, with their permission, uh, in, introduced a data extraction tool and, and downloaded um, key data that allowed me to identify, to map hotspots and identify the basic characteristics of crime collisions and calls for service in the agencies going back seven years, which is two more years than we were able to do for Plainville. So we were able to calculate a, a smoother average, I suppose, uh, in, the, in the Springfield area. Uh, no personal identifying information or narrative information was collected from any of the agencies, which limits uh, some analysis possibilities, but is obviously <coughs> makes everybody more comfortable with the, uh, the collection of the data set. The data from the individual agencies was fused into a master database from which I then uh, calculated the, the statistics and did the analysis. Uh, making things a little bit easier than, than the Plainville project, every single one of the agencies in the Springfield area is on the same uh, records management and CAD vendor, uh, CAD being the location where the calls for service are stored and the records management system where the crime reports are stored. Uh, but they all use the same vendor, so it, there, there was no uh, issue translating different conventions from different uh, systems. Uh, but obviously the overall volume of agencies, uh, plus uh, some, some quirks for this particular vendor, uh, did introduce some difficulties and, and that, that I had to overcome. But everything uh, ended up fine in the end. So uh, we, we got all the data into a centralized database. A uh, screenshot here shows an extraction from the, uh, the main incident table uh, for the combined agencies. And from there, I was able to uh, calculate the various figures that appear in the report. Some broad figures, 
Uh, there are, again, 11 participating agencies representing a total population of just over 400,000 residents uh, based on 2016 census figures, a total area of just over 250 square miles. Uh, together, over the, the seven-year period that's, that, that makes up the baseline period, these agencies made over 100,000 arrests, 103,822 arrests. They had over uh, 350,000 non-arrest uh, crime incidents, uh, more than 3 million calls for service, and uh, 89,000 traffic collisions. Uh, there were 187,000, just over 187,000 unique addresses at which um, crimes occurred in this area, uh, of which I was uh, able to achieve so far a geocoding rate, meaning I was able to actually plot on the map 90 percent of those addresses, which is a reasonably high uh, percentage for a data set like this. There's always going to be some junk addresses in, in, in any uh, crime and call for service data set. Now, there are a lot of statistics in the report. Uh, every agency is broken down individually with its crime and calls for service and traffic collision statistics. I obviously have not, I'm not going to present all of those here to you today. They're in the written report for everybody to take a look at. But some notes on just the general statistics that you'll see in the report, and this is just a, a sample uh, extraction on the screen here. Of what, what I did was look at the the last couple of years worth of data and then calculate an average for the past seven years. Uh, I also calculated the standard deviation of the average, which is basically it tells us on average how much uh, from year to year does the uh, th does this crime or this category deviate from its average. Uh, the coefficient of variation, which you see in the fourth co or fifth column there, uh, tells us um, how much over the seven year period this crime uh, typically varies on roughly a scale of zero to one. So zero would indicate uh, a very predictable, um, uh, unvarying uh, set of statistics for a particular crime, and a, a score of close to one would indicate it's all over the place from year to year, and that's very difficult uh, to predict. Uh, so basically, the smaller that number, the easier it is to identify when something changes, when a, um, an external element is introduced and, and causes the, the crime or the call for service to increase or decrease below the threshold that we would expect for that. So that's all presented in there. There's a final figure um, that I'm introducing in this report for the first time, the, the um, slope as a percentage of the mean. This, this is basically a, uh, it gives you a sense of how the crime is, or the category has been trending. Uh, over the over the seven year period that uh, that we have the data for, uh, this is important because in the Plainville area things had been very static for the previous five years. Most of the crimes and the calls for service we looked at, you know, they'd fluctuated from year to year, but they weren't going anywhere before the introduction of uh, of Plain Ridge Park. Um, in this case, many of the the crime categories and the call for service categories in the the Springfield area had been trending downward uh, in the pe seven year period leading up to the introduction of. of of MGM Springfield, uh, it, with the exception of, of traffic collisions, which had been generally increasing in the area. So for those reasons, we have to analyze any changes on the basis of what the trend looked like prior to the introduction of MGM, uh, and not just the overall average of the statistics, if that makes sense. So um, when that uh, SPM is high, it indicates uh, that category had been trending significantly upward or downward. And as an example, here's some uh, what a trend line looks like for uh, a slope as a percentage of the mean of plus 5% and negative 15% uh, over that uh, that period. You can say, you know, at negative 15%, that's a pretty strong slope uh, that we have to consider. So if, even if, if crime were to even out at that point, it might be uh, considered a change uh, rather than, than simply a, um, a manifestation of a previous average. Christopher. Uh, can I, uh, can yeah, I go please. back just for a clarifying question on a couple, uh, yes. couple of slides ago? The figures you mentioned are the aggregate of all the 11 communities. Um, yes, yes. The, these over the figures. seven years. Over the seven years, yes. Okay, so but it's within the report, they're broken down into the individual communities yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, here are the, the overall violent property, violent property crime and total crime and crash averages uh, per year. Uh, among the the participating communities, and as you can see, Springfield itself, being the, the you know the urban core of this area, with with the largest population of the communities, uh, really dominates the statistics. It, it, it accounts for uh, well over half of the the numbers uh, during the, this period, at least for crime and uh, for crime, uh, violent crime. 
uh, property crime, it accounts for um, about 40 percent, and um, total crime about half, and for crashes, uh, about uh, one third of the total crashes that we see in this area. So Springfield itself really is going to um, to lead any major statistical increases we see here, which is why, of course, it, it makes it important to break it down by the individual communities and individual areas separately so that uh, uh, their changes, if they have any, don't get lost in the overall totals that, um, that Springfield support, uh, reports. Uh, obviously, there's a number of state um, patrolled uh, highways and roads that uh, intersect this area, many of which will serve uh, as carriers to and from uh, MGM Springfield and thus might see increased traffic uh, and thus might see increased traffic issues and traffic collisions. So state police data is, um, is equally important to this effort. Uh, the local communities tend to take most of the crime reports in the area, but for collisions and other calls for service, uh, the state police data set is extremely important. And as you can see from these figures, uh, on all of the roads, or almost all of the roads, uh, over the, the reporting period, uh, the, tr the collision total has been increasing uh, throughout the area, which um, could be signs of any number of, it's been increasing really in, in throughout Massachusetts during this period. So uh, the, there are many causes for that, uh, lower uh, gasoline prices, driving a higher, you know, greater driving behavior, uh, continued economic development of the area, bringing more cars into the area and so forth. So. Uh, Spr MVM Springfield might be a, a participant in, in that overall um, increase that we've been seeing uh, over the last uh, seven years, bringing more cars to the area. That doesn't mean the rate is higher. Doesn't mean the risk of collisions is higher necessarily. Um, but with, you know, we'll hopefully be able to get some figures to help temper this analysis with uh, with calculations of rates. Now, one of the things Chris, that okay. yeah, quick question on this slide. Um, yeah. I'm assuming, so when you're talking about crashes along I-91, it's literally I-91 from the tip of Northampton yeah, all yeah, the way I, down I, along the These other. are within the, it, the, the 11 communities. Okay. Yeah, yes, I Can, is it possible to extract out of that, like how much is happening, say, on I-91 through each of those communities? We have a couple issues that we're dealing with and be interesting to see, are they predominantly in Holyoke, are they predominantly in Springfield, or predominantly in Northampton, you know? Yes, the, the, state, police, uh, the state police data not only identifies the community in which the crash occurred, but also the specific location. Okay. So we'll, we'll be able to identify increases by actual section of road. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. Thank Can you. I also ask, um, so the slope in this, um, in this chart, they're all positive, and that's an indication of increases, just like you said. Yes. Uh, are, there, are they large enough? Um, you mentioned the 15% in a prior slide. That was definitely a trend. Um, uh, just help me understand order of magnitude here. They're, 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 mod they're, they're a modest increase over the seven-year period. So yeah, not so much that, that, um, that it's, it's, it's a really stark trend. Uh, a single more recent year, for instance, uh, 2016, I think, um, uh, 2016 and 17 together uh, were the highest years in the data set um, for the, the past seven years. 2016 on some sections of road and 2017 on others um, it, it's the the slope is small enough that a single a, a single year could have influenced you know the, the overall direction of the slope so yeah I, I did emphasize that it's been increasing in the area but I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it's a a, a stark increase I'd have to actually calculate the p-value but I, it, it's not a, an increase an overwhelming increase until we get to a slope a SPM of around 10 percent okay yeah. Now, one of the things I'm interested in looking at in the surrounding area uh, is what happens at places where people are likely to get on and off the highways uh, on the way to and from uh, MGM Springfield. And, and this map here shows the exits and, and the radiuses around the exits in which we find hotels, restaurants, and gasoline stations uh, to and from uh, on major travel routes to and from MGM Springfield. You can also see the travel routes themselves plotted on the map. I took, um, I seeded the area uh, as, as far away as, as 100 miles with a bunch of different sample uh, starting points and then saw what, uh, what Google Maps recommended as, as travel routes. Not everybody uses that, but I used it as sort of a proxy as what people would be using as a decision-making tool for how they you know, travel to and from the casino. And, um, and then identified the places uh, within those travel routes that might likely see increased traffic. Uh, again, to, to and from uh, MGM Springfield. So we'll be looking at specifically th things that are used by travelers, gas stations, convenience stores, uh, hotels, and restaurants, 
within those, those exit radiuses to see if we see any increases in activity there. Uh, th this map here indicates what was happening in Springfield uh, among certain crimes, th uh, four different crimes, uh, just in the last three months of 2017. And you can see that the, the, the dots are so numerous you can't even really pick out uh, individual uh, you know, crimes, and, which is sort of the, the overall purpose of this map. Uh, I, this is to emphasize that you know, in the radius around where, where MGM Springfield is located, um, you know, because of economics and, and geography and a number of other um, issues, uh, Springfield has had some, some challenges uh, dealing with, with, with crime in that area. It's gotten better uh, over the, the seven-year period um, that, that I analyzed, but obviously we can see that the area is, is something of a hot spot. Now, it's possible that the presence of the casino and the legitimate activity that it draws, uh, as well as the extra law enforcement presence in the area, serves as a suppressive effect to much of the activity that we see here uh, on this map and other types of crimes as well. It's also possible that all the extra people in the area uh, you know, may cause certain crimes to, to increase, uh, just as a, on the basis of, of the number of potential uh, targets alone. And so you know, we have to be prepared to analyze either possibility. Uh, there are mechanisms by which crime could increase. There are mechanisms by which it could decrease. And, so, uh, and some, might, some individual crimes might increase and some might decrease. So it, it's important in the immediate area and the neighborhoods surrounding the casino to take a really close look at, at what happens and uh, what we can both credit and, uh, and not to the, uh, the presence of, of MGM Springfield. Um, based on my work with other analysts around the country, uh, when I asked them for examples of the types of crimes that had increased in their areas after the introduction of casinos, uh, you know, they, they offered some feedback to me about what types of specific locations we should look at. And they, they mentioned things like hotels, restaurants, uh, gas stations, convenience stores, pawn shops, uh, and social service uh, um, facilities within the, the, um, the immediate area of the casinos. And so I, I also mapped those and I identified uh, certain areas uh, around uh, certain businesses and business types around the MGM Springfield area that again it will be important to measure specifically what happens there after the um, the three month and, and so forth um, post casino period and so that brings me to the specific evaluation plan um, in December uh, just shortly after the th well the, the three month period is up at the end of November around Thanksgiving uh, so I about mid-December, after the agencies have had enough time to uh, properly code the incidents that have been reported during that period, I'll re revisit them and collect the data for that, that three-month period and then issue a report, obviously, about uh, what changes we've seen in the Springfield area since then. Uh, it's important to note, of course, that regardless of the presence of a new building, a new facility like a casino, some crimes will increase, some crimes will decrease in any data set that you take from a police agency uh, for a three-month period. And, and so those in, any increases or decreases we see by themselves won't necessarily um, indicate a causal relationship to MGM Springfield. Uh, that's why it's, it'll be very important to do a much further analysis of those increases to see if we see any evidence that, that ties it into the casino specifically. And obviously we've had some experience doing that because of the Plainville project. So hopefully we'll be able to, um, to determine if any, on any increases that we see what the, what the cause is and whether we can attribute it to MGM Springfield or not. Um, we'll, um, and then we'll be looking, obviously, as, as uh, Mark said, not just for uh, you know, broad statistical changes, but what we see down to the micro level hotspot and with a particular focus again on those travel routes, those exit areas and the, the particular business types uh, around the casino that uh, we might hypothesize and increase at. Uh, we'll be working, I'll be working uh, very closely, of course, with the Gaming Enforcement Unit, which has been fantastic about providing data in the past and with the, the agencies in the area and particularly the, uh, the crime analysis unit at the Springfield Police Department. Uh, if there's one major difference in the, this project versus the, uh, the Plainville project, it's that uh, the, the central agency here has a, a very robust and, and well-trained and uh, well-staffed uh, crime analysis unit uh, 
led by Bill Schwartz, who is in the room here, and um, I'm not just saying this because he's in the room, but they, they really uh, have, have done a fantastic uh, job, Bill has in particular, uh, getting that, that uh, agency up to speed with modern crime analysis. And uh, I, I have every confidence that uh, any, any trends that we do see uh, after the, the introduction of the casino um, will be able to fully analyze with the support of, of that unit. And, and I really look forward to working with them closely on um, the, the upcoming project. And that is my report, unless there are any additional questions. I, I had just a couple of quick questions, Christopher, and yeah. thank you for this. Um, I think it is, as you reminded us, it's un important to understand this is the baseline. This yeah. is everything assessed before MGM opened. Um, a quick question on your kind of um, property map where you listed hotels, gas stations, pawn shops, and social services. Um, obviously, there's a gas station right across the street from MGM. Didn't want to take that one into consideration because of its proximity. Oh, my apologies. If one didn't appear on the map, I, I might have uh, uh, something might have gone wrong with my data file, and I okay. and I didn't geocode it. Obviously, yeah. The, um, I don't know why I wouldn't have appeared there. I I'll have to go back to my data set and make sure that uh, that, that I've captured them all. But, okay. Yeah. I just I'm sure that people at Pride wanted to. Yeah, no, I th have some sense. Thank you for that. I, I don't know why that wouldn't have been there. Um, two quick questions. Yeah. Um, Going into your the the full report, um, page three, the executive summary uh, down on the bottom. You talk about possible statistics collected that the report does not cover. Um, I was wondering if you could just kind of shed some light on maybe what those oh. statistics are or what you didn't fold into. One of the things I, I tried to emphasize in in the in the report is that. Um, the more the most important thing about this project or this part of the project is that I have a baseline data set it's not necessarily the statistics themselves that can be calculated from the data set because I could have sliced the data a hundred different ways right. um, but uh, but the fact that the data exists and so once we have the the post casino data um, I'll be able to compare changes in categories that I didn't necessarily include in this report just on the interests of space I mean I could have made this report a, a thousand pages with all of the different uh, categories so uh, some of the, the things that aren't in there I didn't I didn't do much in the baseline data set when it comes to demographic information about offenders and and, uh, and victims uh, I didn't uh, go into a lot of detail about um, origin points uh, for offenders in the area but all this th these are things that that I'll be analyzing after the we have the, the post-casino data set. Uh, so, so for instance, if we, we, we identify an increase in crime uh, and it turns out that um, most of the offenders or a significantly higher percentage of offenders for that crime are coming to the area from outside the 11 communities, that might be a, an indication of, of a, a casino-related in, involvement. But I didn't, for, again, for interest of space, I just didn't bother to, uh, to do a, a baseline analysis of those, um, those origin points. Uh, property types, I, uh, stolen property types, I didn't really include in here. The data isn't great uh, on, on in that particular category, uh, although it might be good enough to identify major changes in it. But uh, I didn't think it was it was worth uh, you know creating a, a section of the report for it. Um, so those types of things. There's a, I guess maybe in this report I don't have an exhaustive list of the fields that I uh, I collected. Um, but mo most of the, the statistics that I did provide in here are from the offense tables alone, which includes the offense type, the, you know, the time and the, the location, and the, um, uh, I was going to say, the, I, I thought I had, I had another f field there, but I forgot what it is. Uh, but I didn't include a lot of statistics on the other data tables. Again, that includes people, uh, property, and vehicles uh, that are involved in crimes. So um, let me just build on that. Um, so even though you did not do it for this report, you'll have the data capability. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that in the future, if we hypothesize or if you hypothesize that there's this outside flow of people, you could go back and corroborate whether that was also existing in the past or not. Pre precisely, yeah. For instance, in, in the Plainville area, when, when we saw an increase in credit card fraud, it became really important to look at, at the origin points of offenders and the, the, the specific types of properties that were being purchased with, with stolen credit cards. Uh, ahead of time, I, you know, if, if I had, it had offered the, the types of properties being stolen in, for every type of crime, it would have just ballooned the report into, into thousands of pages. But um, the, 
you know, once we, we know that there's something to, to look at, the data is there to, to do that additional analysis. And that's yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would also just add, you know, um, kudos to you and Mark and Brian and, um, and Tim and to you, Commissioner Cameron. This is a big effort to get all the hosts and surrounding communities, law enforcement agencies to work together. It's great that they're all in the same vendor, which makes the data collection piece simple, but it's um, kudos for getting that kind of cooperation up front. Now, the surrounding agencies have all been fantastic. Uh, you know, they asked the, the questions that they should ask, but, but you know, once they, they were satisfied with the security and, and, um, and pro uh, confidentiality of the data uh, processes, um, they, they were all very cooperative. And um, I, have, I have good people at each one of the 11 agencies that I can rely on when you know, I have a question or uh, when I need to look at a particular category further, they, they can do more analysis with their own data set than I can with, with what I've collected. And, and it's nice to have that kind of relationship with all of the agencies involved. Yeah, I would just love to expound upon that because it really is interesting and and unique. Um, you know, I've presented at conferences as you have on this topic, and um, uh, one of the things I'm asked is, how did you get the police departments to participate? They all tell us they're so busy, they don't have time, and because without a baseline, it's very hard to then determine what has changed. And as we all know from our hearings, this was one of the major concerns, right? Mm -hmm. Citizens were worried about crime if a casino were to come. So, um, you know, when we started this project, I think some the, the research team um, probably didn't have the right, you know, folks to, to move forward on this. I said, well, let's just start with all the police chiefs. Let's just ask for their help, which is what we did. We went down and invited all the police chiefs down in Plain Ridge, and um, they were just excellent. First of all, it's nice when you ask and don't say, we need you to do X, Y, and Z, but, but one of the chiefs, recommended Christopher Bruce for this project, and he has been invaluable. First of all, he had worked at many of the police departments in Massachusetts, so we had a working relationship, trusted relationship. Not easy for police departments, state police, and all of these surrounding communities around Springfield and Plain Ridge to turn over their data to someone. That is um, a big ask, and making sure it's secure and used properly. As you pointed out, you can cut data in a lot of ways and make it uh, say different things. Um, so that relationship was critical, and I just want to thank all of the police departments. Uh, and, and to watch the level of engagement to me has been um, just satisfying. I mean, they have s all of them in a room um, talking about the issues, what, what do we anticipate, and the idea, uh, one of the things that I find most interesting about this project is real-time information. So every three months, we know exactly what's happening, brainstorming by the chiefs, by the other police executives, um, and, and really the ability to, to change a strategy and not wait till something becomes a bigger issue than it, than it has to be. So that part has been um, terrific, and I just can't thank all the agencies enough for their participation and their enthusiasm about this project. They see the value and not just because it's written on a piece of paper for research, but the, the ability to share data, information, and solve problems, which is, you know, what, what people are looking for. So thank you, and thanks to everyone else that has participated in this project. It really is uh, gratifying. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, I think that's critical, the, the, the real-time mitigation, if you will, the ability to uh, address if there's a hotspot that we can identify early on and, 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 and you know, have uh, mm -hmm. the rest of the GU uh, look mm -hmm. into it or whatnot, leverage the existing police um, efforts at, uh, locally. Obviously, I, I can't be faster than the, the, you know, the crime analysis unit at the Springfield Police Department itself. And, and that, that's, again, the, the great part about this project. They've, they've got an, a unit there that can, that can be re literally tracking real-time changes uh, in, a, in a way that I can't. So that, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to, to, to keep that in mind. They're, they're constantly responding well in between the, the data sets that I'm able to collect. And, and I, I think we have some representatives here from Springfield. I'd love to give them an opportunity to talk about uh, the collaboration and, and some of the efforts that are being made. The other thing I've been really impressed with are the efforts 
with all of the agencies involved, uh, Springfield State Police working together to really keep Springfield and the whole um, metro district safe. So if, you, if you, you're here, you drove all the way down from Springfield, I'd love you to take a minute and talk about that. Grab a microphone. Okay. Have a seat. Just introduce yourself for the record. Good morning, Commissioners. Good My morning. name is Brian Walsh. I'm the Civilian Public Information Officer for the Springfield Police Department. I'm here with our Director of Crime Analysis, Bill Schwarz. Commissioner Barberi sends his regrets for not being able to attend. He's in Plymouth today. One of our officers is receiving the Medal of Valor from the Massachusetts Police mm -hmm. Association, which, uh, which he really wanted to attend. Mm -hmm. So thanks for having us here. Um, yeah, speaking about the Gaming Enforcement Unit, one thing uh, our officers tell us all the time across the state, the relationship between the local police department and the state police may not be that wonderful. In Springfield for years, it's been completely the opposite. Uh, the working relationship there with our C3 programs across the city, um, utilizing resources together, whether it's canines or just working together on, on in the CPAC unit in the district attorney's office, the relationship was there beforehand and everything I've heard from uh, Lieutenant Akers from our police department is that they don't consider themselves state police and Springfield police there. They are the gaming enforcement unit and work together, work together as one team and it's going extremely well so far. Mm -hmm. um, what the commissioner has done uh, since and leading up to when the casino was opening is look at our metro unit and start to expand. Uh, the, there was a C3 South End unit before of about 10 officers. Uh, knowing that we we're going to see 100,000 plus visitors to the city, he expanded that into the metro unit with 40 officers and supervisors. He added kiosks, uh, which is based on, if you see them down in New York City and Times Square, at far ends of uh, the metro unit, which are staffed by officers at peak hours, and they are doing walking posts as well. We added a metro substation right across from the Mass Mutual Center where the events are, so the officers will go directly to that substation as opposed to Springfield Police Headquarters, and many of them are out on foot most of their time uh, when they're working. Um, the commissioner's approach is high visibility and high approachability for our officers in the metro unit. And even this morning as we're here at this meeting, they're announcing a regional visitor center right at the corner of Court Street and Bruce Landon Way where there will be a police presence there at peak hours and high events uh, right a block away from where MGM Springfield begins. So far, it's working extremely well. Uh, obviously, there were some things that they anticipated in the metro unit, whether it's amusement parks, NFL games, when you add 100,000 people down there at all times of day, 24-7, there are some things you anticipate, but many of them have been planned uh, and pre-planned for. Our metro unit so far is just doing an outstanding job. We also have cameras, external cameras, on all of MGM's buildings. Our real-time analysis center is able to monitor those at any time. Um, as well as at our kiosks and all throughout downtown. So if you come to our real-time analysis center, they can pop up the cameras outside MGM. If there's any sort of incident, issue, whatever there may be, uh, they're able to alert the officers, both our metro unit and the gaming enforcement unit, uh, to be able to separate from a potential bad guy and the civilians so that the officers come prepared with that information when they arrive or possibly a route of travel, whatever it may be. Um, Commissioner Stebbins spoke, with, spoke about Pride a minute ago. We're currently working on a volunteer pilot with Pride where our real-time cameras will be able to be utilized at all of their gas stations externally and internally, um, which would be a big assistance as one of the highest um, foot traffic Prides is the one right next to the casino there. But Springfield as a whole, the Commissioner has been there since um, June of 2014. Um, and crime continues, continues to drop. It's just uh, spectacular. It's dropped by about a third of part one overall crime since the commissioners took over. And we continue to see some of that data continuously going down. Um, Springfield's 33 square miles. We're in my backyard, you see a mountain, you see deer, you see frogs, whatever it may be. So it's a unique city. Um, but we've seen nothing but positives downtown in our metro unit. After five, before MGM opened, the workers, anyone else couldn't wait to get out of town. 
it was, you could see tumbleweed on a, on a Monday night at 9 o'clock down in Springfield. And now it's re, it's, the casinos really re-energized the city, re-energized the downtown, um, you know, the foot traffic, uh, the people down there on weeknights, weekdays, weekends. It, it's really been exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's um, <clears throat> important information. And uh, again, I've been impressed with the coordination. That's what's really important to me to see how well these uh, PDs work together. And Lieutenant Babin is here with us. Um, Lieutenant, we're, we're fortunate because Lieutenant Babin headed up the, um, the Gaming Enforcement Unit at Plain Ridge. So there were a lot of lessons learned. And then he has now uh, taken over as the commanding officer up in Springfield with those lessons learned, although in, in a much different environment. Um, Lieutenant, if you don't mind just, just quickly just sharing some of the work uh, that the gaming enforcement uh, working with Springfield PD and the state police is doing. Well, uh, to uh, echo upon what, uh, what Ryan said, it's the cooperative work between the Springfield PD and the gaming enforcement unit. Uh, the metro unit on the perimeter, but within the gaming establishment, it is the uh, gaming enforcement unit. It's made up of both state police and local police. It's a 24-7 operation. We have plainclothes officers inside. We have undercover officers inside, ensuring that the, uh, the public that's going to visit MGM is going to be in a, a well-policed environment, a safe environment. Uh, we have uh, experienced, like any small town, all the uh, crime issues, including uh, narcotics issues, intoxication issues, minor issues, things that were very concerning to the commission. Uh, We've tried to keep a, a tight handle on that. We've had great cooperation from MGM along those lines. Uh, I know uh, DLT Connors had put together a, a short list of, of some of the items to touch on directly that we, uh, we have been handling out there. I'm glad to answer any specific questions um, about any type of crime that we've had in general. It's been a little bit of everything. Uh, the unit has done a, a terrific job uh, with the resources provided by the uh, surveillance and security at MGM dovetailing with the surveillance provided by the city and uh, the metro unit. Uh, and it has, uh, it has been a, uh, it's a busy, it's a lively assignment. There's a lot going on there, late nights and weekends in particular. Mm -hmm. But uh, overall, it is, uh, we've created a safe environment, we like to think, and uh, it's going very well. Thank you for that. Lieutenant Connors. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, again, to echo what, what Ryan said, and it's, it's tough to follow up a PIO that, that is very polished and, and uh, speaks very well. Um, but again, uh, we have had a very good relationship <clears throat> with Springfield Police, uh, obviously prior to the casino coming, but uh, this has gone extremely well. Uh, I, I believe I speak for everybody involved uh, from the get-go. Uh, just by way of background, uh, the relationship began uh, very strongly in, in May when we brought in the team. We identified both State Police and Springfield Police uh, who would be part of this gaming enforcement unit specific to Springfield, to the casino there. Uh, so since May, they've been training. Uh, obviously, gaming is new in Massachusetts. Uh, everybody needed to get up to speed as to uh, certain areas to cover uh, the Mass General Laws, uh, MGC rules and regulations. We had a, a mini academy, if you will, State Police and Springfield Police. So it was a great opportunity for the, the troopers and the uh, detectives um, and the Springfield group led by Lieutenant Akers uh, to get to know each other, to be in a classroom setting for a period of time. And that just dovetailed right into the opening of uh, MGM Springfield in, uh, in August. And since then, the unit has been doing tremendous work, uh, extremely proud of the work that they've done. And it really is a partnership. Um, and those, the group there has really gelled very nicely uh, and they take it very seriously. They're active, they're proactive, they have a vested interest in seeing this work for MGM, for the Gaming Commission and for the City of Springfield. Uh, can't say enough about the work that they've, that they've done. Um, we have a number of stakeholders. Uh, the great, as you mentioned, as far as Lieutenant Babin coming to us from, from Plainridge uh, and taking on the role of leading out in MGM Springfield, he knew the partnerships that we had to make and uh, immediately turn to getting those partnerships in place, uh, specifically with the, the Springfield's Metro unit. Uh, they're invaluable service to us when we have, uh, and there are times when things get, uh, get, uh, get busy there and we need some extra assistance or 
even just some logistical assistance, the metro unit is right there. And that, that relationship uh, appears to be working extremely well uh, as well on an operational basis. Uh, we also have the Springfield Barracks uh, that uh, is within an hour, uh, within a mile or so away from the facility. They've been on site um, uh, assisting in whatever uh, possible times that we need as well. Uh, as Lieutenant Babin mentioned, the relationship with MGM security, their surveillance and their management is critical to the successful operation uh, that we have here. And we worked uh, hand in hand with them. Uh, they've done a very good job uh, in the two months. Uh, and that is a daily uh, evaluation and uh, process that we're evaluating the relationship and how best do we do we serve each each entity um, on site there. Uh, some of the other stakeholders that uh, we, we've talked about are the ABCC. Uh, Lieutenant Babin has also uh, been attending meetings with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, liaison with the Secret Service. We do deal with uh, counterfeit uh, money uh, fairly consistently. Uh, we liaison directly with the Secret Service and conduct further investigations on any uh, confidential, I mean, uh, counterfeit money that, that's been seized, um, ATF, other federal agencies that we do liaison with on a continuous basis. So it is a robust program, and, and Lieutenant Babin is, uh, is, is leading sort of the boots on the ground experience out there for us. Um, and as Lieutenant Babin said, it, it has been a very busy two months for us uh, in the Gaming Enforcement Unit. Uh, it has gone extremely well. Um, it's great that the the facility is is packed. It's uh, the attendance is up, um, and we have a particular role that we uh, have to fill on a daily basis. And I think the team has done uh, a phenomenal job. Uh, again, it's a daily evaluation process, whether it's for staffing uh, protocols, how do we handle certain situations. That is an ongoing piece. Although we come with the experience from Plain Ridge, this clearly is a different facility, specifically with table games and it's a, it's a major city. So those challenges uh, uh, are something that we've, we've taken, we've taken um, willingly and gladly, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see it through. We'll continue to uh, foster those relationships, and I think with Springfield Police, it'll, uh, it'll only get stronger. Thanks, and I know our gaming agents play a role as well, right? There's a, there's a, a good relationship there. They went through the academy with you, those folks. They did, and that was a, it was a great opportunity for them to everybody to get to know each other. Um, obviously, we're physically located in the same space out in Springfield. Um, we pushed for that interaction back and forth. They're a, they're a major resource for us, and vice versa. Um, they come with a, an, a, an incredible amount of experience, wide ranging experience in the gaming world. And we've said to our personnel, make sure you, you know, you're picking their brain because uh, they're a vital source and they're right there and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very good uh, team concept that we've been going on. Um, can, I, can I mention something? Um, uh, this, this is all great and, and I, um, uh, I'm reminded of something that it's a bit of a flip side to all of this. Um, uh, a few months ago, um, our partners at uh, DPH who do a lot of work at the community level identified some concern uh, from some community, some in the community uh, relative to uh, the notion that additional police presence might bring in uh, perhaps uh, more attention or, or, or perhaps uh, more tension with some minority groups. Uh, you mentioned, you did mention uh, approachability in this, uh, in this uh, aspect. Can you expand on that with that concern, at least in, in some people's minds, as to what you know, additional police presence does? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's not something that's been brought to our attention in terms of the casino at all. Um, it's the commissioner's belief is if you have presence and visibility out there, and our police department is the largest or the most, um, has the highest minority rate in the entire state. So you're not just seeing white officers out on the corner. Um, our officers are about 30% Hispanic. Um, and about 10% black as well as uh, white. So when you're talking about that in Springfield, I don't know if it necessarily plays the same role with the uh, demographics, um, but the commissioner's vision is to have police officers out there visible, approachable, so that people are not only safe, but they can feel safe. And it's strategy that's worked elsewhere in places like New York City when they're in Times Square area where there's just a lot of foot traffic. So ultimately when people see officers, uh, the commissioner's vision is that they will not, not obviously be more safe, but they will feel safe as well. 
Thank you. Good question. Anything else? I, I just want to rem I think I heard the coordination with the AG's office and the DA's <laughs> office. I just noticed in my notes uh, that that is correct. And also the Hamden County District Attorney's Office. I mean, that we we do work hand in hand with them uh, on a daily basis. And uh, the Gaming Enforcement Division of the Attorney General's Office handles uh, the majority of the investigation or the, the arrests uh, and criminal prosecutions, although the, the Hamden County DA's office is, is also very hands-on. Um, and those relationships have, have gone uh, extremely well. Thank you. Yeah. And these regional meetings, Christopher can attest to, uh, you know, all of those folks are represented at the meetings. And it really is, um, you know, it's my old line of work, so it's, it's nice for me to, to be around that these kinds of meetings, but real brainstorming where, you know, they talk about, okay, what, are, what this is what we see happening. What are we going to do about this? And just strategies and, and certainly without our um, state local partners that, that that wouldn't happen as effectively. So thank you to, to everyone who's participating. Anything thank else? Oh, thank you. Thanks. Next, we have um, Director Griffin with Workforce <laughs> Supplier and Diversity Development. Uh, before we do that, let, let's give them time to set up. We'll take a five-minute break. Thanks. Great. We will uh, resume our meeting at this time. Uh, Director Griffin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about um, the Affirmative Action Program for Equal Opportunity for Goods and Services um, that is required um, to be submitted by each licensee. Um, and um, this is for minority women and veteran business enterprises identified in Chapter 23K, Section 21, um, for the provision of goods and services procured by the gaming establishment. Um, there are also several license conditions, um, but um, these requirements um, um, indicate that each licensee shall identify specific goals um, expressed as an overall program and a specific um, value of the contracts for minority business enterprises, um, uh, women business enterprises, and veteran business enterprises. Additionally, um, license condition 16 indicates that um, this licensee, Encore Boston Harbor, shall submit a plan to identify local vendors. Um, so with these, um, uh, the, I requested this plan on June 22nd, within um, 90 days as required by um, law. And um, Encore Boston Harbor responded appropriately and submitted this plan. Um, and we're here to talk about this plan today. Um, we posted the plan for public comment on October 4th and um, until October 19th, and we received um, three letters within that um, time period. Um, we received in your packet a letter from um, Mayor Di Maria from the city of Everett uh, supporting the plan. And we received a letter from the Center for Women and Enterprise um, also um, seeming um, supportive of the plan and um, further commenting that the goals set forth in the proposal are in keeping with other efforts within the state. Um, and we received a, a third letter from an individual um, who indicated that perhaps um, this increased scru scrutiny on Encore Boston Harbor is positive, um, and it seemed to me to be supportive of the plan. Um, additionally, we received another letter um, from the Hispanic American Institute um, after the deadline. Um, so I did want to, it, it is not in your packet because we were not able to post it in time. 
we will include it, um, we'll revise the packet um, and include it later. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the letter, but first um, I would be remiss without introducing my guests here. Um, so I have um, to my immediate right, David Granada, Director of Procurement for Encore Boston Harbor. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And um, Nadiuska Ballard, um, Procurement Manager. Good morning. Good morning. And Jackie Crum, uh, who you know very well. <laughs> so, um, so I'll talk just a little bit about the, um, well, no, I think I'll, I'll go into um, my um, comments about the plan. Um, I actually found this plan to be um, very strong. Um, I looked at the first version. You have the track changes version um, in front of you. And um, Encore increased their diversity goals when they heard that the state was um, prepared to increase their goals in FY19. Um, so you'll see the increased goals. Um, this plan includes detailed discretionary spend um, for the project. Um, it includes um, target local spending amounts for the host and surrounding community. Um, it also includes the timing of the procurement um, you'll notice, um, I think it's um, Appendix A, Exhibit A, rather. Exhibit A um, gives um, an itemized list of spend and the timing, um, and that is also posted on their website. It also includes an, a community engagement strategy utilizing local um, diverse um, business groups, um, the commission's own vendor advisory group, um, which is also composed of um, various state and local um, business groups. Um, and so um, I, I thought um, Encore did a great job in incorporating some changes and um, and I'm um, talking about outreach and, and um, the sharing of information about the RFP. Sometimes that is half the battle, is knowing when the contracts are going out. Um, so I will, um, maybe before I open it up for questions, I wanted to go over this um, new letter from the Hispanic American Institute, because I think there were some um, noteworthy um, uh, things that we should um, discuss. So um, the Hispanic American Institute um, indicates that um, it, uh, they would uh, support uh, activating the um, Gaming Commission's vendor advisory team um, and suggest uh, a little bit more information about its mission. Um, you'll notice that the vendor advisory team is noted on page six. Um, I think perhaps we could um, maybe include a little bit more information about um, the makeup and, and um, um, the mission of the vendor advisory team, and I could certainly um, share that information. Um, and um, the Hispanic American Institute also indicates that um, they like some more information about the RF, RFP process, more definition and transparency as to the source selection criteria. And I wanted to, um, because I think this is important, um, uh, turn it over to David to respond to this. Um, for that particular for, point. For this particular <clears throat> point. Yes, so um, good morning again, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. On uh, Exhibit A, uh, uh, the Hispanic America Institute is looking for more granularity on the process. Um, exhibit A is, is illustrative. This is not the complete list. I was uh, really trying to keep it to one page, but there's actually uh, 76 different discrete commodities that we list on our website, on the Vendor Opportunities website. Um, <clears throat> 
and as you can see, it's it's very granular. It's, it, we didn't just say food and beverage, or we didn't say maintenance materials. We really got into the details. Um, and looking left to right, we also spent um, some some time talking about what our criteria might be. Some types of commodities, if we're looking f to supplement our electricians and our plumbers, they need to be licensed. We indicate which ones uh, would be on call or 24 by 7. Uh, to the right, you can see that we talk about the actual timing of the opportunity. And then to address more specifically the Hispanic American Institute's comment, uh, if you note the three footnotes at the bottom, uh, we took some time to add a little bit of color to what we were saying up in the table above. So we do talk in footnote two about a lot of our criteria for our decision making is obviously the quality of the product or service, the cost, which is always important. And uh, for an operation like ours, like MGM's and th uh, operations of that scale, the scale of the supplier's operation, you know, the ability to deliver product in volumes and certain frequencies. So we, we think with Exhibit A, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we're addressing some of the uh, requests for granularity um, from, uh, from Nader's organization. Okay. And we tried to cram a lot of information onto one, one sheet of paper. So it says a lot, hopefully. Great. Um, um, another comment um, that I wanted to raise, um, uh, they wonder if you will consider hosting bidders conferences where the upcoming RFPs are discussed and the requirements explained. Uh, we, we will. Um, we refer to them as walkthroughs. And uh, so it's a standard practice in, in the procurement industry. Now, you don't necessarily do walkthroughs when you are RFPing a box of widgets. But certainly, uh, as an example, when we start talking about pest control and we start talking about services um, across 3 million square feet, what we will typically do is we will, in advance, or, or, or when the RFP is going out, we'll schedule a walkthrough where all the bidders are there. They all get to walk the space, mm -hmm. ask their questions, see the back of house hallways. Um, and what's good about that process is everybody is getting the same information. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Nadia and I have worked together for years, and um, we also have a, uh, a practice um, where during the RFP process, if somebody asks us a question, hey, I don't understand requirement number four, when we respond, we respond to all of the bidders mm -hmm. because we want, again, um, really level playing field and everybody has access to the same information. So that's just an example. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, were there any other um, of the comments that you wanted to respond to? Um, <clears throat> Uh, we, uh, we do not intend to do a set-aside. Um, we feel very strongly that there are very strong MBEs, WBEs, VBEs out there, uh, as well as uh, businesses in our, our host and surrounding community that can win meaningful business from us because of the quality of their operation. And um, a set aside is, um, I don't think, does anybody any good. Mm -hmm. I, we, what we want to do is we want to create access. Access, as we'll describe in this plan, is really how we intend to drive business awards. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about that, but we really think truly that if we can cast our net wide enough and give that access and those solicitations to dramatically higher vendor base, then we think very simply that will just um, exponentially increase the awards. So there, there, there's the human factor and the human bandwidth. And again, we'll talk about it a little bit later that if we can overcome it with technology, which we can because we're already starting to do it, um, I, I, could, uh, I could RFP something to a thousand vendors with n n not the concern that we would never be able to disseminate that information. Okay. Um, Can I build on that, Mr. Granada? Um, mm -hmm. 
thank you for that explanation. Um, I, um, at least anecdotally, I, uh, I know that um, access notwithstanding, mm -hmm. um, the requirements of an RFP, the, the connection may be one thing, and, and knowing that something's coming up is, is, is great. Mm -hmm. But for a small business, and this is true also for you know, some minority uh, uh, and women businesses, um, it could be daunting to respond to you know, a number of prerequisites Mm -hmm. Some of which are come directly from from the licensing process. So uh, I recognize that you know mm -hmm. part of it is um, systematic, um, but it could be daunting to respond to them. And then maybe that person, the small business person, says, "Well, I'm going to have to pass because I don't know about you know all mm -hmm. these prerequisites just to be able to respond." Mm -hmm. uh, what can you tell us in that that's that's alluded to or described in the plan relative to trying to overcome? If anything, that at least perception barrier that somebody is just simply not able to scale up mm. or spend a lot of time responding to many prerequisites, if you will, mm. um, at the moment that it comes to the to that RFP. Well, I think there's two um, there's two ways to address it. One is, and and I know that MGM was actually successful in Springfield doing this. So we uh, we talked to a lot of the same vendors. Um, Granger, WW Granger is a big big company that sells everything. Um, <clears throat> uh, MGM uh, Granger approached MGM months ago about their tier two. So. Basically, what they're doing is Granger is sourcing from local and certified diverse firms, um, and uh, MGM is benefiting from that because they're buying through those firms. But Granger acts as, um, I guess, a, a council, a, 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 a an ability to scale and protect the customer. So. We do a lot of business with Granger as well, and we've had those same conversations even within, I think, the last week or two, we, uh, we had them in our offices. So we think one way to approach it very simply is to, um, for, thing, for, for types of commodities where we need that scale, an alternative is to buy through a bigger partner who themselves have a very strong plan with certified firms. Um, the, th the second thing we do is, and we, we discuss that later in this plan, is um, in our RFP process, when we are awarding business to a big, could be a Fortune 50 company, we have very specific utilization goals that we, that we will typically ask for. So I believe it's Exhibit B is the rider to our RFP document. Mm -hmm. um, and this really is verbatim. Um, when we RFP something, this Exhibit B is, is an attachment to every one of those um, solicitations. And uh, as we did during our construction phase and our design phase, uh, we, we push these, these firms. Uh, these are not checkbox, checkbox items in a contract that uh, contract sign, it's filed we drive them because our, our name is on this. We've, we've made commitments and representations to our, our, our neighbors and the Commonwealth, and, and we intend to hit them. And uh, so nobody said it's easy. We can't say your utilization goal for MBEs is 15%, and then we just sit back and watch them do it. Typically, you have to chase, you have to drive, and um, it's why we're actively recruiting for a diversity manager right now because we're going to need a a, uh, um, a very aggressive pit bull to ensure that these things are actually done, um, and that's how we're going to succeed, hopefully. And just Thank to you. add to that, I, the, the other thing that's really important is Dave and Nadia's group has focused on this a lot recently. It's been affairs and education up front, making sure that people are aware of what those prerequisites are right from the get-go so that they can prepare themselves for when we do go out to bid. Yes, the, the, uh, the Exhibit A, the, uh, we keep referring to it as the opportunity matrix, has really been well received um, because it's not, um, it's not vague. It's specific. It's 76 commodities. There's requirements. There's timing. We hand them out at all of our vendor fairs. We, Nadia's going to talk in a minute about um, 
uh, some of our outreach activities and, and also about our spend objectives. Um, but we, we finished a, a fair yesterday down at the Royal Sinesta in, in Cambridge. And so we regrouped after that and we started looking at all the registrations and the walk-up traffic to all these events that we've either hosted or attended. And in the last six months, we're approaching 1,300 um, individual businesses and or business owners that we have met personally, one-on-one -on -one meetings, eyeball to eyeball, talking about their firm's capabilities and how can we partner. Um, it's really been, um, and we intend to keep doing these. We're not doing it till opening. Uh, we're separately uh, trying to build an organization. We're interviewing madly and hiring people. And so the, the more folks we can add to our team, the deeper we can go out in these um, ongoing initiatives. So um, would you like to start generally talking about the plan? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I would like to thank Jill, by the way. Jill has uh, really been invaluable. The difference between our, our first iteration and our second, we've gotten wonderful guidance. And um, so I want to thank you for helping us navigate thank you. through this. Um, <clears throat> So as I alluded to a little little while ago, um, we the, the the emphasis for us is uh, is threefold. It's identifying those firms. It's soliciting those firms across a much wider base than than a typical procurement organization might do so, and. Uh, obviously, the real objective is to award meaningful and ongoing business. Um, it's, it's just an exercise if that's not the end result. So we kind of worked backwards from if the goal is really awards, how do we increase awards? We, we feel we increase awards by increasing solicitation. How do we increase solicitation? We do that by going out and identifying all those firms. So that's why for the last six months, we've really been holding these fairs and we've been attending um, uh, GNE MSDC events. Uh, Nadia was in Framingham Friday. Uh, CWE. Yeah, 400 uh, WBEs. Uh, we've presented to the, uh, the North Shore uh, Latino business community. And so a lot of, a lot of that was with an eye towards identifying those firms. And um, so those are the three key objectives. Uh, we've worked very closely with um, uh, John's uh, SDO office. We've worked very closely with uh, GNE and the CWE. Um, and we have ongoing meetings with the Chambers of Commerce, too. Uh, we've invited the Chambers to all of our vendor fairs. They've attended pretty much all of them. And um, it's been very successful because we're, we're helping the chambers reach deeper into their communities. Um, we have tables at each event for the MGC and for um, the CWE and, and all, all of the different diversity organizations with an eye towards using it as an opportunity to explain to people the benefits of certification that go far beyond doing business with Encore. It just opens up doors to state and federal spending that would otherwise not exist. Um, and we encourage at each of these events, uh, right at the beginning, visit our partners. They're sitting back there in the corner and, and un understand the value here. So with that, th those are the, the major objectives. Uh, those are some of the, the um, uh, high level outreach that we've done. and the chambers that we're working with. And so with that, I will introduce Nadia Ballard. Morning. Uh, she'll talk about our spend objectives. Morning. Good morning. morning. So I'm going to talk about the spend obje objectives, and then Dave is going to explain how we plan on achieving them. Um, we have established two types of commitments to create economic opportunity. The first one is diversity. Um, we have committed to spending 8% um, of our discretionary spend with minority business enterprises, MBEs, 
14% of our discretionary, discretionary spend with women business enterprises, WBEs, and 3% of the discretionary spend with veteran business enterprises. Um, we utilize the Commonwealth of Massachusetts definitions of MBEs, WBEs, and VBEs. Um, and like David said, um, a more detailed description of that discretionary spend is on attachment or exhibit A. Um, or host and surrounded commitments um, are $10 million annually with Everett-based vendors, $20 million annually with Boston-based vendors, $10 million annually with Somerville, Somerville-based vendors, $10 million annually with Malden-based vendors, $10 million annually with Medford-based vendors, and $2.5 million annually with Chelsea-based vendors. I, excuse me, I'm sorry, I had sure. a quick question. I know that um, you know Everett through Medford came, as, came through uh, as a result of the host and surrounding community agreements, but I couldn't go back and discern where the $2.5 million commitment to Chelsea came from. I, I went through the kind of arbiters agreement between Encore in, in Chelsea, but I'm trying to figure out where that commitment came from. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I'm just yeah. trying to figure out. I know where the others came from. I'm trying to figure out where that one came from. Right, and as you'll recall, Chelsea actually didn't sign a surrounding community agreement with right. us. It went through the arbitration process. I believe that that was a commitment that we've made to them as a, as a subsequent, uh, through subsequent discussions. Okay, thank you. Back to you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I had given um, uh, a few minutes ago the, the, the three main objectives at a, at a high level. Uh, really, on, on, on page two, the plan objectives is getting just a little bit more granular in some of the things that we're doing to identify those firms. Um, we do have a, an Encore Boston Harbor website. Um, as I mentioned, there's the vendor opportunities um, with it, within that. So there, there's the ability there to register as, a, as somebody that's interested in doing business with Encore. Um, so they can provide their, their vendor information. They can indicate whether they're a uh, certified diverse firm. Uh, they have the ability to tell us what their, their general product or service offering is. So. We have that website. Within that website is this opportunities matrix, which is our attached exhibit. Um, we do meet with these groups on a regular basis, so the Hispanic American Institute, uh, the chambers. Uh, we actually, uh, it was a very interesting meeting. Uh, I think it was maybe about two months ago. We had all seven of the chambers. We invited them there to really just have an open discussion about how we, sh we should up approach our upcoming fairs, uh, our vendor fairs. So it was very interesting to get all the chambers because they didn't necessarily agree on everything. Um, but we said, hey folks, we can do, we can do fairs that are open to everybody, um, all commodities, all categories, just big, really huge events. Or we could tailor them specifically to um, to categories and commodities that maybe are more prevalent in your community. And that's how we ended up dividing the fairs up into a, a food and beverage fair in this city and a maintenance materials fair in that city. So it was very interesting to sit down with all these chambers and um, ask them for meaningful input and in how we should approach this thing. So these fairs were really a reflection of how we wanted to do it, but also how each of the our, 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 our host and surrounding communities preferred to do it as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, we've had ongoing meetings with the Urban League for I don't know, years. It's been it's been going on for a while, mostly focused on workforce development, um, but with us now hitting a point where we're really going to begin our, our true RFP process as we <clears throat> approach 2019. 
Uh, we're going to expand that into these are going to be uh, regularly scheduled. I, is it monthly, quarterly? Do you do you know, Nadia? So we're probably going to do them monthly. Okay. Um, we're probably going to have our first one within the next month, mm -hmm. um, depending on how many mm -hmm. vendors we're able to capture. Mm -hmm. um, we'll decide whether we want to mm -hmm. do them monthly or quarterly. Gotcha. Okay. So it'll be our first one uh, discussing vendors, but it will be um, one of many that have been going on on, on the workforce side. Um, <clears throat> uh, page three, uh, uh, Northeastern's event. These, these were some of the, uh, the events that we had um, attended and or hosted mm -hmm. as, as of when I had submitted the plan to Jill. Uh, and we then, uh, again, that was this was mid-September. We talked about our upcoming community outreach activities, most of which have already now occurred. So, with that, I'll, I'll give the floor back to Nadia to describe um, a lot of the things that we've done okay. since mid-September. So, like David said, um, we have been meeting with vendors since March. Um, our very first vendor fair was I think March 17th. That could be wrong on the date. Um, and we were able to capture about 350 vendors during that event, although it was a snow day, which was wonderful. That, that many people actually showed up and um, we were able to meet them. Um, we learned a few things from that one. Um, there was a lot of uh, vendors that attended and at the time there was a small group of us. Um, so we were not able to meet with 350 vendors, although we tried to. So we decided to split them into smaller vendor fairs, commodity-based, and have the appropriate people attend each one of them, which is what we've done in the past few weeks. Um, in the past few weeks, I want to say we've been able to meet close to, uh, I think you have the number, four, about, four. about 400, 400 vendors. Um, and we've been able to engage with them directly and also have the, the people there that are looking for certain types of services and products. Um, so I think it's been beneficial for us and for them to actually have the face-to-face -face time with the end user and be able to present um, their products. Um, we did allow them a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, they were pre-scheduled, so they were able to come in, bring their products, present to them, and show them um, what they can do for us. Um, we haven't awarded any business yet. We're in the process of RFP right now. So this is the perfect time to find these vendors, try to work with them, and try to get them where they need to be, where we can actually purchase from them. Um, a lot of the vendors that I have attended the events are minority firms, women-owned firms, and a few veteran-owned firms. Um, so we're hoping that you know, working with them, um, we might be able to get them to, like Dave said, the point where we can actually purchase directly from them and not have to go through uh, a, a bigger company so, so that they can be first tier diversity versus second tier. Um, we, uh, we have been able to put this together, by the way, with the help of um, a lot of our partners. Um, I, I have to mention them. The GNMSDC has been absolutely great. They actually help us put together all. Do you want to say the acronym? Not everyone knows. Sure. <laughs> the great, <laughs> the it's Greater New England that. Minority <laughs> Diversity Council. Um, the, the woman. Um, Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. The Center for Women and Enterprise. Um, the supply. The Commonwealth Supply Diversity Office. Um, the Hispanic American Institute. Um, and the North Shore Latino Business Association. And the chambers. And, you know. Yep, mm -hmm. and the chambers. Um, they were a uh, great help to us. They have been great partners. Um, they were able to get most of these vendors to our vendor fairs, um, which it's invaluable to us um, in trying to meet and achieve our goals. Um, I think that is pretty much it on the vendor fairs. Mm -hmm. Me? Yes. Okay. Um, the only thing I would add uh, to what Nadia said is <clears throat> uh, we took, uh, it was kind of a speed dating approach. So all of our fairs, we, uh, so people would come uh, to the front desk, which we had staffed with folks, and uh, we would award them, a, uh, not award them, we would um, assign them a, a time slot, and they were seven minute intervals. And we wanted them to be longer, but we wanted to be able to talk to folks. 
So the, the structure for all of these things was we would have somebody on the microphone calling out the time. So we would say one minute ago, and then the next uh, minute we would say, okay, the, the 10.22 a.m. meetings are now starting. Please approach your table. So it was very structured, but it was a, it was a way to really get folks to speak to those business. At the event in Cambridge yesterday, we had limo companies talking to our director of transportation and our, our limousine manager. They were talking to the right folks. So, so that was one benefit to the, um, to the, to the format that mm -hmm. we chose. And um, okay, so with that, <clears throat> um, these outreaches will continue. We, we've, we've uncovered some wonderful relationships already. Uh, we don't want to name uh, the vendor, but we have uh, a certified WBE based in Massachusetts. I don't believe they're in a surrounding community, but they're Massachusetts-based certified, where we've identified them for about six or $700,000 of spend in the next hopefully next two or three weeks. I think they're going through licensing right now. Um, but it's somebody that we met at one of these events, and they said, here's what we do. And we said, wow, that's, uh, what, we're looking for. that's what we're looking for. And they scaled. And um, it was interesting in that we had, to, we had to convince them that the opportunity was real. They were concerned that um, that, oh, Encore, they have relationships maybe out in Las Vegas. We would never have a shot at this. And so Nadia and I spent a fair amount of time explaining um, we're from Massachusetts. We're not, we're not here from Vegas. I, I've lived on the North Shore for 20 years. Um, Ninety-some-odd percent of our staff is born within probably 20 miles of where we're sitting right now. Um, we had to convince them that this was not an exercise and just using them as leverage. And we said, but you can't participate if you're not willing to go through the registration process and give us a meaningful bid. And they did it, and they won it. And that's just the first of many, hopefully. It's a big piece of business. That's great. So. Um, <clears throat> Solicitation is the uh, is the second objective. I I, I I discussed a little while ago. Um, when when a buyer is overseeing an RFP, there are the, just these built-in limitations. I mean, how how many bids can you uh, uh, give meaningful attention to? Maybe maybe ten, maybe twelve. That's even high for some things, depending on the complexity of it. So there's this built-in throttle coming right out of the gate where um, you're limiting who you're sending it to just because you have to. So working backwards, as I had mentioned before, where, okay, if the, if the goal is awards, working backwards from that, how do we solicit more? And uh, it's, when, when I wrote this thing, Bob DeSalvio asked, he said, is that a word? I, call, I refer to it as templatized. He's, and you know he's like really is that and I said I don't know but I put it in quotes just in case it isn't <laughs> um, but it's a templatized approach where when we send an RFP out we will say here's the thing here's the widget that we're looking for and you have to put your your SKU number in this box and you have to put your proposed unit price in that box and your unit of measure in that box by taking that approach, which is really just, here's the format of the RFP, please ensure that you respond and put the information in the right place. Now you can just step back in technology, and we're doing it, this is not speculative, um, can just take all of that information and run it through this very simple tool that says this is the lowest proposal, this is the second one, this is the third one, this is the 82nd lowest proposal. Um, we would, uh, it, that's what I would refer to, I guess, as the heavy lifting. Um, so it still allows us to make um, the decision with um, the human element, but it allows us very quickly to, to broadcast this thing very widely and then say, okay, so which, which one of these are from our host or commanding community? 
which one's an MBE, a VBE, a WBE. Um, so we've done this. We did this at the last place that we worked, and um, we actually have the tool. Uh, is that the tiny URL that we keep hoping? Which I'm looking at tomorrow. Good, yes, good. So we had the tool where when we worked previously. Okay. We have the tool today. Okay. We intend to use it, and we think we can really broadcast these things um, very widely. So. And I think I kind of morphed right into uh, three. I think I talked about how we overcome those limitations. I'm on page seven. Um, greater visibility leads to greater awards. Um, one of the things that we've explored, and I don't know, I hope we're going to be able to do it, but we've explored um, linking networks. So I've spoken to uh, John Fitzpatrick about about the uh, the uh, their their database and some of the other diversity databases, and everybody's giving me notes here. So. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, if I didn't get notes, I'd be speaking faster. Okay. We're going to look at a bunch of technology uh, potential solutions. Some of it may be linking networks, and some of it may very simply just be. Um, um, plugging, plugging a link to our site onto some of our partners' websites, and people can click and say, what's Encore bidding right now? Is that fast? Okay. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Nadia now for organizational support. Uh, so the plan is currently being led by Dave, who's our director of procurement, myself, I'm the <laughs> procurement manager. Um, and then we also have the full support over senior leadership, leadership team, and that is comprised of President Bob DeSalvio, or General Counsel Jackie Crum, um, or Executive Vice President of Operations Brian Goldbrands, and our Chief Financial Officer Frank Casella. Uh, this group will comprise the Organizational Steering Committee. Um, the mandate of the Steering Committee is to ensure that the commitments we've made in this plan have the highest visibility within our organization and to take the necessary steps as needed to ensure that the plan's objectives are achieved. Um, we're about nine months away from opening, and we, like Dave said, we're still in the process of hiring and interviewing people. Um, we're hoping that our team is gonna be about 10 to 15. Um, we're currently at nine, um, hoping to get more in the next few weeks. Um, by the end, of, hoping to be fully staffed by the end of the fourth quarter of 2018. Um, and like, that, like Dave mentioned, we're also in the process of looking and interviewing, um, hoping to find a procurement diversity manager to directly lead all aspects of this plan. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave again. Um, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll go th uh, diversity development assistance. Uh, we're on page eight. I'll go through that quickly. Some of, some of these items I think we've already discussed. Um, <clears throat> We are uh, we are having conversations with companies like Granger to uh, partner at a tier two level. Um, uh, that's one example. We're pushing in our contracts um, for utilization goals, which again um, we need to then sometimes chase folks. But that's the way at the end of the day that you do hit your numbers, and we've got good experience doing that in the previous phases. So we intend to do that as well operationally. Um, and we're also now thinking about mentoring programs. We, we're doing some things on the workforce development size to partner uh, at Everett High School and other, um, uh, other uh, organizations, and, and we're now putting thought into how can we do that on the vendor side as well. If we are helping high school and, and college kids um, with their career paths and uh, alternatives and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we feel strongly we can do the same thing on the vendor side as well, which might be um, partnering with our executive chef, Joe Leibowitz, or our director of uh, facilities who's, who has a very big building that he needs to keep heated and cooled and clean and et cetera. So, we're looking now at doing things like that and modeling them after what we've done in other areas of our business. Um, 
uh, I guess that's it, really. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be repeating myself. But it's really about <clears throat> identifying them, soliciting them, awarding them, um, and giving advanced visibility through any number of means to either show them what what we feel the criteria is, to show them when the opportunity timing is to continue our meetings with the Hispanic American Institute and others, and really just keep driving the program um, well, well beyond opening. And uh, I, I'll open it up to questions, too, if, if um, the commissioners have any. Questions? Yeah, I had a, thank you both for your presentation. I had a, a, a couple of questions and a few comments. <laughs> um, you know, what's, what's interesting is MGM, through all of its hosts and surrounding community agreements, paid a, uh, put a tremendous priority and focus on hiring. Mm -hmm. uh, Encore's place through hosts and surrounding community, it's a tremendous value on local business spend. Um, and it's interesting because you, regional, you know, reg employment has kind of a regional focus. Mm -hmm. Purchasing small business relationships can actually impact all corners of the Commonwealth, which is kind of interesting, even though obviously there's there's also very concentrated uh, focus on the companies mm -hmm. in the hosts and surrounding communities. Um, just a couple of notes, you know, the, the Vendor Advisory Task Force, which the Commission has worked with and organized, um, I'm glad to see them referenced in the plan. They can obviously be a great source of not only helping you find potential vendors, but also providing a lot of technical assistance and financial resources to, uh, I think to your point, to mm -hmm. help a company get the contract, maintain the contract, and, and put their uh, business at a capacity level to uh, maintain the contract. Um, very interested and you know, pleased to see parts of the plan talking about mentoring the small and diverse local vendors, that's key. Uh, you know, you talk about it a lot, about um, a meaningful and ongoing business relationship, mm. and that doesn't stop after the bid's <coughs> awarded, I mm. think. Um, going through some of the other pieces, <coughs> I went back and looked at the host and surrounding community agreements. Uh, you also made commitments to purchase local gift certificates from local businesses. We did. Um, yes. I think Malden, for example, was like $25,000. Mm -hmm. um, I do look at that figure as being in addition to what you plan to spend. That is our intent, yeah. Separate uh, items. But I'm wondering, as, you, as you're doing this whole procurement process and in introducing yourself to the community, are you publicizing the, the fact or making the fact aware to a business that you get introduced to that as a salon, has any other type of business that may not have that direct uh, biddable good relationship with you, but mm -hmm. saying you might be a great candidate for us to buy some gift certificates from. And I'm just trying to think of how you were kind of formalizing that process. I think it can yeah. contribute to your MB and WB mm -hmm. and BBE spend. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. But um, that was kind of a piece in the plan. It's not significant dollars and may mean significant dollars to a local company, but that's a piece of the plan that mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to have you kind of go back and just shore up because, again, it was laid out in your host and surrounding community. Agreement. Yes, it, it's, it's definitely, it's incremental to everything discussed here and um, the further support of that is I was not even aware of the gift certificates until about a week or two ago when somebody said, oh, Dave, by the way. So um, it absolutely is incremental. And I think to your point, Commissioner, um, we, can, um, we can and should think carefully about how we buy them um, because um, it, it can contribute to the spirit of this, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's aside from the goals that we've already set. Um, so it was a, a new revelation for me, but um, well, I'm actually working with Jackie's team on that right now as far as how we're going to utilize them. Okay. So, um, also again, just referencing the host and surrounding community agreements. Uh, it may be old terminology, but there was talk of making sure that um, businesses are quote unquote win certified. Mm -hmm. um, 
not quite sure what that meant, but is that helping with building the level of capacity or is it just making sure that obviously um, the was small it? businesses ha have mm -hmm. a vendor capacity or performance level that mm -hmm. you expect? I, 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 no, no content. I think when we were talking about when certified, and we'll now say Uncle Boston Harbor certified, what we mean yeah. is that they go through the vendor registration process uh, and meet the requirements that we have internally for insurance and other things. Okay. So the key, that's been one of the key messaging points during these vendor fairs is to let them know what we require in-house as well as the uh, Gaming Commission's requirements. Okay. All right. So it's a two-step process, MGC registration followed by us. Mm -hmm. I had uh, one question. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like you've, uh, you've made a a really strong, very strong effort on the front end mm -hmm. uh, to recruit and to encourage, um, make the make the contacts in the communities. But I'm wondering if you have a mechanism on the back end for those firms who may have been unsuccessful to receive some feedback. Um, and you know, just you were really strong in ABC, but there are others mm. that may have been stronger in D and E, mm. and 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 that does two things. It it gives folks the opportunity to improve, and secondly, it keeps them engaged. You know, lots of times if someone's unsuccessful, they say, "That's it, I'm done. I'm never applying again." And if you had a mechanism like that, I think that could be helpful as well. Yeah, that's that's great, and and in. Uh Full honesty, no, I had not put a lot of thought into that. Um, we, we do have a requirement where we, uh, uh, we will respond to every, um, um, somebody that submitted a proposal, we'll, we will say sorry, we're, we've chosen somebody else. So what we will never do is not ever get back to them. But no, I had not put thought into that and I think, um, I think it's a good idea. I think that's something we can develop mm -hmm. because it can tell these interested businesses um, where they need to shore things up mm -hmm. or maybe partner with somebody else. I, you know, so I think that's great feedback. We'll, we'll work that into it. Okay. Anything else? I believe we have to vote on this plan. Let me just make uh, an overall comment along the lines of what you introduced this overall plan, uh, Director, and I think um, there's clearly been a lot of thought uh, put into this. There's a lot of um, uh, tactics that we've heard from uh, all the work uh, that you've done prior to this, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the uh, Access and Opportunity Committee and others. Um, I think uh, it, this the document reads well because it's straightforward, as as is your your approach, um, and I and I really look forward to uh, a lot of these uh, coming to fruition. Um, I like your uh, the anecdote that you uh, that you mentioned which was perhaps a little bit of the question I had about this MBE that thought that, or, or a WBE, mm -hmm. that thought that the opportunity was going to be for others in elsewhere. Um, but, uh, but to the extent that you can make those conversations that much more uh, ubiquitous or much mm. more, more a, a recurring theme, uh, maybe, maybe that anecdote uh, will become uh, an occasion to be you know, repeated and whatnot, um, and, and, and that's really where the opportunity um, hmm. comes up for, for all those businesses. I, I think that's a challenge for the whole diversity community. I've heard that from um, Peter and others, and, um, and that's part of our job is to say this is real and then demonstrate it by awarding that yeah, business. And we're mm -hmm. definitely willing to work with them. It is the perception, it's definitely a, the perception of a smaller business that they're not going to be able to be up to the scale of what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, but we are working with them and encouraging them and explaining to them that they have a chance just like anyone else does. Mm -hmm. um, um, Madam Chair, I would move that the, the commission approve the uh, supplier diversity uh, and commitment plan is provided by Encore Boston Harbor. Um, is included in the packet with um, a, a couple of uh, kind of follow-up items uh, with respect to their plan. First, that um, uh, it's such appropriate time that uh, they share with us their 
plan or strategies to um, address this issue around the local purchasing of gift certificates. Um, secondly, to the degree that they want to report back to us, I think on your suggestion about uh, working with vendors that might not be chosen, I think that's a, an interesting strategy to build upon. And um, thirdly, that uh, as you said, you're in the process of hiring a diversity manager. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I would um, uh, invite uh, Director Griffin at some point to one give us an opportunity to meet that diversity manager, hire you know, uh, report at any point. I think as you see fit uh, to talk about that individual's work and how you're progressing on meeting some of the diversity and inclusion goals. I second that. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Four zero. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Jill. Jill. Director Griffin, do we have one more item there? One more item. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Is it still morning? Oh, oh good afternoon at 1201. Um, so actually, I'm here. I just have a brief update for you. Well, let's introduce oh. Crystal. <laughs> Crystal Howard, our um, Manager of um, Workforce Supplier and Diversity. Hi. Hello again. Good okay. afternoon. All right, we're on the right foot now. So um, I just wanted to give you a little update about an event that we're going to be hosting here at the Commission. Um, on November 5th, it's, uh, it will support the efforts of our th all three licensees in their goals toward attaining their vendor contracts and procurements with veteran-owned businesses, primarily. Um, tidbit, the date's actually ideal because this uh, occurs in tandem with National Veterans Small Business Week, which actually runs the 5th to the 9th, and this event's on the 5th, as I said. so. We're purposing this event primarily as a catalyst to spark greater awareness among the entire veteran community, not just the small business owners who've been identified. Um, so we're inviting all organizations and entities that deal with veterans as a whole at all, and it, just to make sure that they have the knowledge of what happens here, what the casino's goals are. And actually, um, OSD will be here to provide some information just in general about getting certified as a VBE. So it's an opportunity for them to work with state contracts in general, not just us. So um, that will actually take place from 1.30 to 5 on November 5th right here in this room. Um, there will also be, each licensee will get a chance to present. Um, actually, what we just heard is a really good example, hopefully to just energize the room and tell them of some of these VBEs who are having really great opportunities, but also to give an awareness of their opportunities that are upcoming or some events, vendor fairs that they have that they could engage some of their veteran contacts in. Um, and then there will be a resource fair portion of sorts where they can just network with other individuals in the room, see what they do for veterans, how they could communicate and contact on some of this initiative in the future. Um, yeah, so when we actually, we've heard that the interest and appreciation from the casinos themselves is pretty high in this event. They've determined that it's important to them and that it will be a good resource for some of the issues that they've been having in that realm anyway. I think that's it. Do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, just curious. Uh, the flyer doesn't identify an RSVP, and I don't think you, you should. Yeah. But do you have a sense as to whether um, there's already some people we did we sent an actual invitation out on Monday this was really just an awareness piece for you guys the invitation has um, you just contact me so if you guys want a copy of that invitation I can send it to you we have it in flyer form and digital form um, but we had a pretty great list uh, Commissioner Sevens was actually really helpful with convening some veteran partners Jill obviously had a lot of contacts as well um, and it's um, 
growing. As we go through the week, we've seen more interest, we've gotten more names, and we just keep pushing it out. There will be a reminder invite as well. So if you think of anyone or you have a contact you think should be in that room, I would be willing to get this out to them. But to commission. To Commissioner Zuniga's point, um, what we can do is um, put that information out on the website again so that people who are listening know who to contact. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. And it is on social media. Um, Mike got it up on Tuesday on all of our social media outlets as well. So I hope many people make it. Yeah, I think it'll be great. Great. Sounds great. like an excellent idea. Great work. Well, that's it. Uh, thank you both. All set. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we are moving on to um, on Ombudsman Ziemba, and he's got a number of items and a number of um, paper <laughs> binders. He hasn't even gotten an application yet. And it's I wonder when you're going to get called. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Um, today, first on the agenda, that we're continuing our review of the 2019 Community Mitigation Fund guidelines uh, for our next funding round, which begins on February 1st of 2019. Uh, I'm joined here by uh, Construction Project Oversight Manager Joe Delaney, Staff Attorney Carrie Teresi, Director of Workforce Development Jill Griffin, and Mary Thurlow, our Community Mitigation Fund Program Director. So. Um, full team here today. So our review today uh, is part of our effort to publish guidelines for the 2019 program by the first, uh, first week of December. Uh, the Commission, as you know, uh, met on September 13th to develop a list of questions to consider in reviewing the fund. Uh, since that time, we've met with the Local Community Mitigation Advisory Committee uh, in Region B once. Unfortunately, although our meetings uh, have been scheduled with Region A and the Subcommittee on Community Mitigation. We've been unable to meet due to some quorum issues, but we're going to continue to try to meet. Uh, we have meetings scheduled in November for A and B uh, and the Subcommittee of Community Mitigation and the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee. Uh, as you know, this is a really, really robust um, way of taking a look at the fund each year, but we, th we find it very, val very valuable. We get a lot of very good input from all of our uh, local and state partners. Uh, I'd like to thank all those members for a lot of the good advice that they've provided today. So what we're trying to do is we're not trying to finalize the guidelines, and there's sort of many, uh, uh, quite some ways to go before we finalize those in December. But what we're trying to do is get some consensus just on the discussion draft of, of the guidelines. That doesn't mean we're making any final determinations regarding what will be in the guidelines, but it's really just a draft to solicit more discussion of items that are outstanding. And indeed, just because we include something in the draft guidelines, that doesn't necessarily even mean uh, that something will be funded in the end. Um, as you know, it's a very exhaustive review process for all applications that we receive. Um, the process that we are engaged in is very similar to what we did last year. Last year, we sent it out to uh, the public uh, to get comments, and then we reconvened to, to consider all the comments before we issued the guidelines. So if we can get approval for the discussion draft today, I'd recommend that the Commission uh, put forward this draft for a comment period to end on, on Monday, November 19th. That's right before the Thanksgiving holiday. So um, the goal would be to come back to the Commission at the December 6th meeting so the communities would have roughly about two months to put together their applications before the statutory February 1st application deadline. Uh, what we have today in the packet will most likely not be the final guidelines. We'll probably do some wordsmithing, even without comments. Uh, what the draft is meant to do is provide you very significant detail regarding all the concepts that we're entertaining for the 2019 uh, fund. Um, the first item uh, that I'll just mention is that should we continue to have an overall limit for the fund, each year, in order to be conservative, we, we take a look at uh, available funding and what we should put out there for uh, projected targeted spending. Even though we put out a projected targeted spending each year, uh, in reality, we have awarded less uh, than the targets each year. Um, last year, we awarded pretty significantly less. 
uh, we, as, you, as I just mentioned, it's a pretty exhaustive process, but we have to make sure that we're fulfilling the statute and that all applications, all the applications that we receive, uh, they always look like very, very good projects, as you know. But the thing that we have to make certain is that the, the projects are directly connected to the, to the casino and uh, for purposes related to that to fulfill the statute. So currently, there's approximately uh, $5.2 million that uh, remains unallocated from previous years. Um, in addition to that, we, have, uh, we are estimating that approximately $1.5 million will be generated by MGM Springfield uh, this fall up until December 31st of this year. Um, uh, again, we take the conservative approach when we're allocating funds for the, uh, for the upcoming year. We stop counting funds uh, basically as of December 31st of the prior year uh, just to make sure that we don't run over. Uh, the one thing that perhaps is maybe not as conservative as previous years, we held back amounts for future funding rounds in previous years. This year, we're recommending that we can spend the full amount uh, outstanding, um, or at least we could target that spending uh, with the anticipation that we will uh, have further revenues gener generated as a result of the Category 1 uh, facilities. John, so in other words, that full amount would be the 5.2 minus the plus the 1.5? The 5.2 plus the 1.5. So 6.7. Yes, yeah, 6.7. But obviously, um, MGM Springfield continues to generate yep. revenues, so there'll be more monies that go into the fund. Absolutely. But based on our conservative approach, we could spend that much. Yep. But in reality, we probably won't. Um, so one thing I will mention, that 5.2 million uh, figure, there is an asterisk on that. We currently have one item that is on hold. Um, we reviewed a Springfield application relative to the Focus Springfield um, site, and we put that on hold. The commission said basically at the time that we would award no more than $300,000, but there were significant issues involving the uh, anti-aid provision of the Constitution that we had to take a look at. The status of that is that we have had discussions with the City of Springfield and we're awaiting a further narrative for them on a different approach on how they would uh, take a look at the impact that, uh, that they believe is being caused uh, in that corner of the uh, MGM Springfield project. Um, I don't have those uh, documents today, but we're expecting them soon. But they're still there though, right? I mean, uh, what, uh... they're still there. Um, and um, in the location, they're still there in that location to the best of uh, my knowledge. Um, I don't believe that there's been any, any action to move to, to move them, to, to move them mm -hmm. as of now. Right. Oh. Um, so I, we just mentioned the total amount of funding that's 6.7, which is the 5.2 of old and 1.5 of new. Last year when we uh, did the guidelines, the commission included a statement of intent in its guidelines. And the, the statement basically said that in future years we would consider breaking up the fund uh, by region. Um, as we will have new revenues in from MGM Springfield, new revenues that are anticipated from the Encore Boston Harbor facility, what we heard from our dialogue with our, with our local partners is that both in Region A and Region B, there is an appetite for us to take a look at the fund uh, as, as sep separate funds within the overall community mitigation fund. So that, in essence, uh, Western Mass money, MGM Springfield generated money, could be allocated to the Western Mass region. And then, um, similarly, money in Eastern Mass would be dedicated to uh, Eastern Mass purposes. At the time, we, we said that, well, um, there is this is a statewide program. We also have to account for the Category 2 impacts uh, because the, their method of payment, they don't pay into the mitigation fund on an ongoing base, basis. Category 2, as you know, goes for the horse race development fund and for local aid. So what we have in your uh, program, in the draft program, would be the first year of that regional allocation. And so what we're recommending is that we split up uh, the, the funding. So if we take I'll just give, it's easier to explain this by way of example. So if we have $5.2 million and we anticipate that we spend about $200,000 off of the top for the Category 2 impacts, uh, because our spending has roughly been about 170 on average or, or around there. So if we allocate $200,000 for Category 2 impacts, that leaves you about $5 million. 
And so if we split that up, that $5 million of the existing funds, we would have $2.5 million available to spend in the east and 2.5 to spend in the west, with the exception that we have 1.5 from new monies that we could then add to Western Mass. So with that regional allocation, we could do 2.5 in the east and 4.0 in the west. But that does take into account that uh, because MGM Springfield is operational, it is generating new types of impacts. I don't know if you have any questions on that type of an allegation. Just so I'm uh, in, I've been privy to the conversations and the feedback, obviously, from the Western Mass Group on this on this topic, and I just want to be correct in, in, in assuming that if something happened in Region C, the $85 million license fee, if it was awarded in Region C, part of that is allocated to community mitigation fund. Your, so your plan might be to take whatever Region C license he contributes, that would be used to address community mitigation needs. That, that's exactly right. Region. So we would take a look at it that you would have a portion the initial of The initial funding, so they're not like Correct. looking around for a pot. Yeah. So the initial funding could come out of the license fees. And if, if we did have a Region C, uh, the, the funds that would be generated by a Region C facility could be kept within the Region C area. Okay. Um, one thing I will mention is just like last year, we allocated $200,000 uh, for technical assistance program in the event that the tribal facility moves forward. And that uh, money's already been accounted for, uh, so it's not new monies, but we, will, we recommend that we continue that program into next year. Uh, those funds would not be eligible or available for technical assistance uh, unless the commission makes a separate vote to free those uh, dollars up based on a determination uh, that the, uh, the construction of a facility may, may occur in the next fiscal year. So that also addresses that, um, that particular need. Um, can I just mention, um, I, uh, I was initially, and this, I'm going back years. Yes. Initially reluctant on the notion of splitting a fund like this, just from the sole uh, theory that it diminishes flexibility for a state agency, and we are a state agency to really look at, you know, statewide uh, priorities. Uh, but fast forward to uh, to today, and I think there's a lot of um, virtue, if you will, or a, a lot of um, a business case to split it in some way that is equitable and rational, um, and um, and and you know, whatever really whatever money comes out of that region will go to, in, to, to mitigate the impacts from that region uh, appears to be really what a lot of local um, partners uh, see as equitable. Um, there's a long history of um, the Western Mass um, uh, region feeling like um, money from that region gets um, disproportionately spent uh, elsewhere, notably in the East. Um, but, and I understand that they understand there will be different monies coming from each region, at least if the projections pan out uh, like, um, like, like they're uh, projected to be. Um, so I think uh, this, this is a really important year in which we would make that move, um, that as we are beginning the operational phase, it would be the time to, to entertain it and to do it. Um, something tells me that, you know, with this document, you will get that much more um, input in this in this regard. Uh, but I think that with a small caveat of at least um, um, uh, carving out a reasonable amount for the category two, um, that the splitting up of, of the of the regions would ultimately make economic sense. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I, I had some concerns about it at the outset, um, but I think through going through a few rounds of this, we've gained a level of experience of what expectations are, amount, you know, revenue generated, already kind of seeing what communities in the region are looking for, and again, uh, have certain expectations about what the fund could be used for. So I think it's, uh, I'm a little more comfortable with it again now, kind of having a couple of years under our belt. 
You know, one thing I will note is that we included language to make sure that the commission has the discretion, if it's necessary, to not uh, to very closely abide by those targeted spending. We very, very much view those allocations as targets, but uh, it's you know it's quite clear that we have ongoing relationships with all of these communities. So if we don't adhere to those targets, we'll definitely hear about it in all of our local meetings. So if we if we um, if we don't adhere to those targets in any one year, there's a language in this draft that says that we would try to then make it up in future years through some way, shape, form, or manner. But we also have the ability to look back at this policy every single year. Mm -hmm. the, the guidelines are done every year. So we want to make sure that we are addressing the needs that we are told to address, but try to do it fairly between the regions. And mm -hmm. I think that this, uh, uh, at least this draft as of now, knowing what we know, uh, goes a long way to doing that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I suppose that, at least in theory, uh, we could be in a situation where, you know, on a steady state a few years from now, where we may be facing uh, real pressure to fund a project in one region uh, that might be, in the overall, less meritorious than a project in another region, only because, well, the, the funding has been segregated. Um, but I think as Commissioner Stebbins was saying, with the experience that we have, the process that you've put together with all the team about, you know, being really diligent about uh, matching an impact to a um, to the casino and whatnot, um, this this effort could really you know, th this this probability would be at least minimized uh, in terms of you know funding less meritorious projects. I agree. I think um, it's in keeping with the legislation, which is one license to each region. So this really does follow that theory and make sense. Good. Right. As for some of the other recommendations, uh, you'll see that a number of the recommendations have not really changed since last year. There are a number of um, programs that we included in last year and previous years, grants, uh, specific impact grants, transportation planning grants, uh, non-transportation planning grants, um, and then reserves, reserves that we awarded in our first year. We continue to allow those. We haven't made dramatic changes in those. We still have the specific impact grants. Uh, but the one thing I will note is that now that MGM Springfield is operational, we have now expanded the eligibility for the purposes of the specific impacts to cover both operational related and construction related impacts. And this will be the last year where you have both um, because uh, we have some construction impacts that have occurred that perhaps would be the subject of an application. Uh, in Eastern Mass, we continue with the restriction that we only have construction related impacts uh, because obviously they're still in construction. The one exception that I will uh, state to that is that uh, in Eastern Mass, similar to what we did in Region B last year, uh, we state that uh, police training costs could be eligible now. And uh, last year we funded a grant for the Springfield Police Department that enabled uh, some of uh, their uh, members to fully participate in the Gaming Enforcement Unit and then other folks to get trained to then fill their spots in, in the Springfield PD. And basically what we are doing is an apples to apples comparison between that program uh, in Western Mass and eligibility for Everett for this upcoming year. Uh, so that is one notable exception uh, for the, um, uh, the prohibition against doing operational related impacts uh, in Eastern Mass. Uh, we uh, still have workforce pilot programs at 300,000. I do know that this continues to be an area of great interest in all of the regions. There's a lot of support for workforce pilot uh, programs. Undoubtedly, we'll get some comments uh, to this uh, during, our, during our reviews. The thought of keeping it at that same level is that, hey, we will receive those comments uh, as part of our reviews. But one of the other things that we have to think about is that um, there is a gaming economic development fund out there. And the gaming economic development fund uh, lists a number of eligible purposes and, and job training is sort of squarely within the gaming economic development fund. Uh, also, both the host communities have, will have and have significant resources to bring to bear 
um, as a result of their, uh, of their agreements um, to potentially dedicate to workforce development. That doesn't say that we can't consider an increase to this amount uh, come the December application, but at least as of now, that is some of the thought that went into that status quo um, operation. But I don't know if Jill, if you wanted to, if the commission would be interested in a sort of a very brief summary of, of some of the successes to date. Uh, we know that uh, we've had a, a lot of interactions with our, with our grantees about this. We do have our Western Mass grantees coming in in November. So I'll give you highlights. Um, in Western Mass, cumulatively, the program served 219 individuals in FY18. And we're starting to see some exciting results. Now the MGM is opening. Um, you know, for example, the, uh, the scholarships, 72 scholarships were awarded. Um, the gaming school had a 86% completion rate. 81% were hired by MGM, and 86.7 um, of those individuals in the gaming school were new to gaming. Um, so that was really exciting. Um, additionally, we have individuals who were part of the um, adult basic education program, both um, English language and um, high school equivalency. O over 100 individuals and starting to see some gains there. Um, we have a accelerated high school equivalency that's a smaller program, 32 individuals, five received their um, high sets, uh, high school equivalency. And a pilot line cook training is starting, uh, or started, um, and they hope to actually um, expand that next fiscal year. <coughs> and then in Eastern Mass, their efforts have really focused on spreading the word. Um, and they launched a new Casino Career Advisors Network, um, which is composed of career centers, community-based organizations in Metro North, Boston, um, workforce regions of the, of, um, uh, Metro North and Boston workforce regions. They've met five times with Encore Boston Harbor. They're learning all about the um, jobs and, and requirements. Um, they also have a pilot culinary program um, that has a high placement rate as well. Um, additionally, they have um, um, outreached um, over 400 individuals have received in-depth service like career counseling or industry orientation, um, application assistance, that sort of thing. So those are just the highlights and um, we'll certainly um, share more as the word comes in. I, I just to interject, I think what's been interesting about the workforce development pilot money has been we've seen in the last two years how our funds are being leveraged by the applicants to, again, tap into other monies that might be existing. Um, I know Mark Vanderlinden and I are talking with in terms of looking ahead to the research agenda, trying to actually figure out what communities are experienced in terms of the workforce impact and talking with both local and statewide stakeholders to figure out what data we can look at. So as it moves along, it's going to it's obviously having some good results, but hopefully we'll get some data that we can go back and look at and see what direct impacts we're having as well. So that's good work. Uh, to continue on, next category, transportation planning. We're not recommending um, much change here. There was a question that we talked about in September, which is, should we expand our transportation planning grants to include uh, the construction costs of transportation projects for the first year? And I think uh, at this point our answer is no, with a caveat, I'll talk about a, a new proposal for a new subset of a program. But I think our answer is, is no for the reason that um, uh, there will be a lot of evaluation of the transportation system uh, over the course of this next year. There are a number of different look back requirements in all the surrounding community agreements. In addition, our Section 61 findings, MassDOT Section 61 findings, there is going to be a tremendous uh, amount of review of how um, the transportation system is accommodating MGM Springfield related traffic. So given uh, th those outstanding reviews, we thought it would probably be wise before we started jumping into paying for um, actual uh, transportation, basically roadway projects. 
And similarly, um, out here in Region A, we're still in the, in the process of constructing the facility, and we won't know the impacts of, uh, of the mitigation uh, that they've agreed to for, for quite some time. Um, however, you know, I, we have always focused on what do we need to do to make sure that we are ready in the event uh, that there are any impacts beyond what we've anticipated. And um, what, we did, what we're doing with transportation planning is getting ready, and the, um, the new proposal that I'll talk to talk about in a, in a little bit is also something that could be uh, put into that same category. Uh, I mentioned the tribal impact grants. Uh, no change there. We would continue with that 200000 Non-transportation planning grants, uh, we recommend that we continue with that, uh, that program, uh, but with one minor change. Uh, currently, we allow funds to be used for non-transportation planning, and, and they're really useful when it comes to economic development planning. One thing that we would specify, we're recommending specifying in the guidelines, is that planning would also include activities such as uh, providing technical assistance and promotion of, of uh, groups of area businesses, not singular businesses, but groups of area businesses. And what that could do is that could uh, help prevent uh, issues or, or remedy any issues um, if there are any uh, impacts from the MGM Spring facility or indeed the Encore uh, facility on area businesses that we could try to see what we could do to promote uh, those area businesses to make sure that they succeed. Uh, and it, we know that MGM Springfield is, uh, is uh, doing a lot of that work as well. But the grants, uh, what we're specifying is that they could be expanded for this purpose. So John, remind me, we, we, we need to put this out for comment? Correct. Okay, all right, I just wanted to make sure. And I don't know, commissioners, if, if you've all had a chance to review this, if you have any additional questions for John. I think this is a very good, you know, first draft to, to put together. It's a, it's an incremental effort like uh, like you've done in the past to build on um, essentially what what we've done to this day, and we uh, we look forward to hearing from the local community mitigation uh, committees and others relative to. Uh, and then once we get proposal. it out for comment, we come back in front of the commission for yep. a more in depth discussion mm -hmm. and a vote. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Good work. Great. Great. Uh, and there's uh, the transit projects of regional significance. There's some detail in the guidelines that describe that, but if anybody needs further uh, input on that, I can, I can certainly provide that. Thank you. Great work as usual. All right. Good. So at this point, we'll move on to the um, Region A Local Mitigation Advisory. Committee appointments? Yes. So we continue to try to make sure that we um, get our local committees uh, fully membered up, um, if that's a word. Uh, <laughs> so uh, just recently, the commission made some appointments. Uh, we had a Everett Chamber of Commerce representative, Colin Kelly. Uh, it was one of our recent appointments, unfortunately, due to some uh, work constraints. He is uh, due to move on. We really thank him very much for all of his assistance that he has uh, provided. Um, and then we are recommending one new member, which is the economic development spot, a regional economic development spot. Um, we're asking the commission to approve a person uh, by the name of Mr. David Bancroft. Uh, uh, David works currently in mass development. Um, he is the Senior Vice President of Community Development for Mass Development. Uh, in this position, he's worked in the, in the greater Boston region. He's responsible for the agency's brownfields, pre-development, co-working, and trans, transfer, transformative development initiatives. Um, he joined Mass Development in 1999. I've been telling folks in the office that I've known David for about 20 years, but I guess upon reflection, I've known David for closer to 30 years um, uh, since we both worked in housing at the beginning of our careers. Um, so anyway, I, we're, we look forward to his expertise and um, also the expertise from Vincent Panzini, who would be the new Chamber of Commerce representative from Everett. Mr. Panzini, was, he was born and raised in Everett and graduate, graduated from Everett High School. He began working right out of high school 
uh, in the banking and related technical areas and did so for 21 years. He was educated at Bentley University with a bachelor's degree in management. Um, in 1987, Mr. Panzini opened up a financial advisor practice in Everett and began a 31-year career, uh, year career in that field. Um, he has been particularly active in the Everett Chamber of Commerce, and this year he is the president. Uh, so we think that we would be well served by these new appointees. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the uh, appointments of Mr. Panzini and Mr. Bancroft to the Region A Local Community Mitigation Advisory Committee. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Four zero. Thank you. Great. Commissioners, my final item is uh, relates to a filing deadline that is coming up. Um, there is a, a deadline for filing of legislation by state agencies. Uh, that filing deadline is the first Wednesday in November, which this year would be November 7th. Uh, included in your packet are two pieces of legislation that we had filed in previous years, an act relative to horse racing and wagering, uh, and the second piece of legislation is uh, an act to enable municipal and regional planning agency employees to fully participate in gaming policy advisory committees. Let me just start with this uh, later one. Uh, we worked uh, with the State Ethics Commission to craft this language, and basically what it would do is it would enable a lot of our local partners to fully participate in our advisory committees. Uh, right now there is a danger that if you are a municipal employee or a regional planning agency employee, that you could potentially be uh, uh, in violation of the conflict of interest law by participating and providing advice. And basically what it is is that when you participate on our advisory committees, you become a special state employee. And so there could be a, a potential conflict if your local area duties also involve gaming-related duties. Uh, the Ethics Commission, I think they felt very comfortable with proposing legislation that would enable those local partners uh, to fully advise the commission as special state employees, but they would um, be able to do their local duties at the same time. One thing that we will want to do is we will want to continue to work with the Ethics Commission on the language. Uh, we were unsuccessful at getting this, this thing through this past year, and perhaps one of the obstacles might be that uh, we try to amend uh, MGL Chapter 23K, which is the gaming statute. Um, there is a lot of hesitancy about opening up that statute. So potentially we could craft language to accomplish the same mission in another uh, method. Um, in addition, I, I think we've had some conversations about expanding uh, the, the reach of this legislation to maybe cover, cover some of our other advisory committees. And I, I think that we could accomplish that same thing through conversations with the Ethics Commission uh, by the time we have hearings in, in the spring, March or April. Uh, but uh, as of now, uh, we, need to, we still need to do those conversations. Uh, the next uh, piece of legislation, I'll, I'll ask uh, General Counsel Blue to help me with this one, but uh, this is our horse racing and wagering legislation. Um, as you know, um, the, the situation with, uh, with racing and simulcasting uh, every year, um, there's an open question about what will happen as, uh, as there are certain um, deadlines that are imposed by the legislature. We had an extension of the simulcasting law um, right at the deadline this, this past year. That has been extended till July 31st of next year, of uh, 2019. So uh, it might be a very important thing for us to, to, to seek out uh, all of the members that will have a hand in looking at uh, racing legislation as early as we possibly can, um, given that, that deadline, and that we can go work with them as, as much as we possibly can. I'll, I'll let uh, General Counsel Blue uh, talk about the more specifics of that legislation, but I also wanted to just put it in context. So we have these two pieces of legislation, but there are other pieces of gaming-related legislation that are very likely in the next legislative session, and uh, specifically, as you're aware, the Supreme Court earlier this year um, they uh, had a case that involved sports gambling, um, and as a result, there has been a lot of movement in other states uh, to develop legislation authorizing sports betting. Uh, since the Supreme Court decision, a number of 
Other states such as Delaware, Mississippi, New Jersey, West Virginia, and Rhode Island have acted to legalize sports betting. Uh, at the close of formal legislative sessions here in Massachusetts in July, there was a lot of dialogue about what Massachusetts would do in the wake of that Supreme Court decision. Uh, Chairman Joseph Wagner of the Joint Committee on Econ Economic Development and Emerging Technologies said at the time, quote, we will get about the work of this quickly so that when we do convene for the 2019-2020 uh, session, we can be ready to go. As you're aware, the Commission issued its white paper on sports betting in February of this year. Undoubtedly, we will continue to need to be prepared to provide expertise and input as the legislature intens intensifies its review of the sports betting issue. Together with the July 31st, 2019 expiration of the racing statutes, the Commission may be quite busy early next year on, on the legislative front. And with that, I'll turn it to General Counsel Blue. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, the racing bill that is in your packet is essentially what we filed last year. We made a couple of minor tweaks to it. We changed a, a shall to a may to give the Commission more flexibility. But generally, the basis of the bill is that there is not a lot of definition in it. Um, it does require the Commission to draft a lot of regulations to determine how licenses are awarded, what has to be filed, um, whether the Commission wants to address issues like simulcasting and live racing separately. However, the Commission wanted to do that. So it is essentially the same bill. I would imagine that we are going to get comments on it like we have in previous years. And hopefully this year, we're racing, at least on the thoroughbred side, looks like it's starting to end. Um, perhaps we'll get more input from the stakeholders in thoroughbred racing and you know, maybe get some support there. So, so it is essentially the same. But we're certainly open to discussing it or making changes in it where appropriate. I, I, I for one, I completely understand it's the same bill we have filed and appreciate the tweaks to it. But um, again, as you pointed out, as we heard on Monday, there may be no thoroughbred racing in Massachusetts after June, I think, of 2019. So um, I'd love to find a way for us and the stakeholders to finally be able to have a singular voice uh, in talking with the legislature. And you know that might mean, I think, and also to John's point of getting the stakeholders together so that we're going to the, uh, the legislative leadership with one voice. How, how best we can do that, I don't know, but I think it's incumbent upon us to try. You know, to that end, I, I don't think there's any changes that I can see in the, in the proposed bill. Um, I would emphasize, and I know we've done it in the past, it's just not uh, very clear in the proposed letter that we have here, sort of like the background, and it doesn't have to be lengthy. What has brought us now to this place? This is really now the third time that, uh, that we've done this filing, or it may even be the fourth because uh, the Gaming Act requires us to look at the, at the state of the simulcasting and racing statutes, which were set to expire by the Gaming Act in, originally in 14 or 15? In 2014. 2014. And prior to that expiration, we filed uh, bills accordingly, and the legislature has instead extended the simulcasting statute, the one set to expire, uh, now for three times, and my guess is that um, you know they they um, don't quite recognize, uh, and I wouldn't blame them for that. Um, that you know the levers of the um, racehorse development fund and the many other moving parts um, work together, and and to the point that you've made earlier, um, there needs to be you know a number of things in place. Uh, and one of w one of those is at least some business certainty into uh, what a, a regulatory framework might look like. I feel that you know our our bill is flexible enough to provide that. Uh, you know there would still have to be a number of answers, uh, a, a number of uh, details to be filled in. Um, but um, I I really think that this this year is important more than ever to make the context that a one-year extension is, in my opinion, simply not going to cut it. Uh, because the very likelihood that um, there might not even be a track where to conduct the two or four or six racing days uh, um, you know, 
just 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 to draw on some other purposes. Uh, I really hope that they that we don't find ourselves in a situation in the, at the end of July or June or at the end of the legislative session where you know some people begin to pay attention to this. Um, they have way many other priorities, that's for sure. But I really think that the, the context of these expiring uh, statutes that have only been extended is important to educate uh, uh, um, the people up there as to what needs to be done. I really think this needs attention. Great. Yeah, and I think if there's a legitimate proposal, which we hear about, but it has not happened yet, um, we hear about from a number of different sources, if, if something like that comes to fruition, then it probably would be the um, uh, you know, uh, more interest in taking this matter seriously. Mm -hmm. So I don't think this requires a vote, but you understand yeah. that this is the legislation we'll revile and pursue and, yes. and monitor on sports betting. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else on that topic? That Thank you both very point. much. Um, we'll move on to commissioner updates. Any updates today? Hearing none, uh, do we have uh, a motion to adjourn? Uh, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you.